Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Tex Ags Radio. Billy Lucci here on Tex Ags Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, 50-50 right? ball, I got to come down with You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. Obi, this might not be your generation, but follow me for a moment. Growing up, there was these video games, like Tech Mobile, for instance. Do you remember Tech Mobile? Or no. no. Okay. Bo Jackson was incredible on Tech Mobile. If you gave him the ball, you were going to win, okay? okay. Um, Walter Payton, he was unstoppable on Tech Mobile. NBA Live, there's a game. It was like, a, I forget, it's been so long. I think it was three-on-three, three, or maybe it was two-on-two two basketball, but with NBA players. And if you made, like, two shots in a row, you'd start getting hot, and then, like, you wouldn't miss, and, like, there'd be, like, flame on your player. If I were to use that analogy for a current Texas A&M athlete... <laughs> Who would that be? Well, it might be a couple, but the first one would be uh, Braden Montgomery. Holy who, smokes. Again, and what was it that Bronny was pointing out that he's, with the exception of Florida, because he did it in, uh, I guess, the second game, but he's, he, he's, he's homered in, in every park. In, the, the first at bat the, of every park, right. with the exception of Florida. That he's and he hit in. a home run in the Florida series, by the yeah. way, just not his first at bat. He's, he's homered in every ballpark he has played in. Yeah. So, uh, and and on all but one on the first at bat. Four straight games with a home run. It's crazy. I forget the number. Is it like five out of six games he's hit a home run? Something to that effect. Five uh, home runs in four games. Excuse me. Five home runs in four games. Olin Buchanan, your thoughts. <laughs> he's amazing. Yeah. You know, uh, again, we talk about could he be the best transfer ever to AM regardless of sport? And if he keeps going the way he is, I mean, I know Eric Casares was a big deal transfer from Oklahoma. It's a big deal, yeah. But but I'm starting to think that Braden Montgomery even exceeds the uh, the impact and of his, Eric Casares. His impact goes beyond the home runs, right? Because yesterday I forget what inning it was. Maybe it was the third or fourth oh. inning. Uh, two outs, little shot to to center field, yeah. score a couple runs, and, he, and like like. And I think he had two strikes, if I remember correctly. I might be wrong on that. But he just continues to deliver. It is fun to watch him. Like, and it's also like almost fake. Like, that's our player? Yeah. That's our guy? He delivers like the Octo Mom in bunches. She did deliver. <laughs> she certainly did deliver. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Aggie Baseball taking care of business 12-2 over Texas State. Hey, by the way, it's Texas X Radio. Did you know that? I did. Yeah. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Mm -hmm. You knew that part, yeah. too. In the Rollo Insurance Studio. You knew that, too. Yeah. And it's the Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. <laughs> yep. Big fan of that whole situation, aren't you? Absolutely. So, yeah, Aggie Baseball, we can start things off with. Really had a good time uh, watching them last night, and uh, they're just fun to watch. I mean, yes, the wins. Any team that wins a lot is fun to watch, but th this is a good group. But. But they went in spectacular fashion. Yeah. Like, what's what was the old? Uh, you know, you you brought back the old the old video game. Video game, the old commercial. Chicks dig the long ball. Remember that? Oh one? yeah, I do. Remember that yeah, commercial? I do. Well, I mean, these guys ought to have chicks all over them because uh, <laughs> man, they're hitting the long ball left and right. It seems like. No, they they are, and you know, even Targo yesterday getting into the act playing well. This is gonna. And, I mean, just look at that on the schedule. It's all green, right? A couple of I mean, I don't even see reds. I know there's a red out there somewhere. A lot of, a lot of W's, it's been my friend. A while. Uh, yeah, just, you know, hope they keep coming because they are just storming toward a, uh, a securing a, a, a home, you know, a home field in the, in the playoffs. Now, I will tell you, because I'm a warrior. You know, I'm a warrior. Yep. 
I'm worried about South Carolina this weekend. Well, you should be. They're, they're good. A, you're on the road. They're an SEC team. That looks to me, and I don't claim to know it as well as Richard and, and uh, Ronnie, but it looks to me that outside of Missouri, everybody else in the SEC has a strong baseball team. Yep. So uh, you got you to play well, especially on the road, but – why would I expect them not to? Yeah. I mean, and let's go back to that Florida series. They could have won that series. Yeah. They yeah. were leading late in the third game. Like, they, they could have won that series. They could have. And, and quite frankly, they didn't. They have the lead early in the first game, too. Yeah. So, um, but there's no shame in losing to a, a – what's Florida ranked now? You know, I know they're, they're in the top ten, I believe. I, I mean, they're outstanding on the weekend, right? They're, yep. Now, they're, they're vulnerable during the week. Uh, and, and you're on the road. So, right. you know, road series are hard to, hard to win. Florida, even with their losses, is number six in the country according to the most recent D1 rankings as of April 2nd. I'm going to read you those rankings. Are you okay? Or at least yeah, the, let's the do top that. ten. There's a bunch of SEC teams. Number one, the best pitching staff in America. Arkansas. Arkansas. Number two, Clemson. Clemson. Don't know anything about them. I know they're good because I see them in the rankings, but I, I haven't paid attention. Number three, your, your Texas A&M. See? We're yeah. good partners. Number four, Tennessee. Tennessee. Oh, three out of four from the SEC. Interesting there. Number five, Oregon State, who last week was number two. They lost a couple over the weekend. Okay. Number six, Florida. Florida. Flo Rida, your favorite rapper. Flo. Number seven, Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. Another SEC team. So is every Gabe team Bach but two. always said Vanderbilt. He <laughs> That's what he said. Like Art like Vanderlei? Uh, I guess it's just because, uh, you know, you're – Kind of a uppity, high brow. Yeah. Part of, if you go to Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt, number eight, a team that won in a walk-off fashion last night, DBU, Dallas, Dallas Baptist. Baptist. Every year since I've been here, I know they were, but they, they're always they're, in the yeah, mix. They always have a really good program. Yep. Out there. Number nine, Duke. Duke. Ten, North Carolina. If you're interested in the other SEC teams and D1's uh, rankings, number thirteen is Alabama. Remember when Florida State was undefeated? They're fourteen. They're not SEC, obviously. Number 17, Kentucky. Number 18, LSU, who lost last night again. To uh, who they lose to this time? I don't remember. It was not even a team that they should lose to. I remember to. they lost to Southern recently. Was that last night? I don't think it was last okay. night. Well, they lost to somebody like that. Um, and then remember when Wake Forest was number one? They were number one for a little while. They've dropped yeah. to 21. South Carolina, number 22. Mississippi State, 23. Um, that's the, the relevant ones when it comes to uh, – SEC teams and teams that we've kind of seen in the top five. Uh, fun start for the Aggies, no doubt about that. Absolutely, and hopefully it keeps going. And I, I think I was looking at the stats, and, um, I, you know, the, it, if you just look at SEC games, Braden Montgomery leads the SEC in home runs just in SEC games because yep. the kid from Georgia's, but he's I, batting over 500. Yeah, and he's got stupid. a bunch of home runs. But, most of his home runs have come against uh, in non-conference games. Um, the pitching's doing well. And they obviously hit. Um, yeah, there's, um, there's every reason to, ex- to, to expect that this is going to continue. Yeah. But it's not going to be easy, and it's not supposed to be easy because I think SEC baseball is even m- more competitive than football. Yeah. 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 And, and it's I mean, you think about the – SEC teams that have won national championships just recently, LSU, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, and, and Tennessee was considered the best team in the country the year that they, yep. that, that they uh, didn't get it done. Georgia has won a national championship. Florida's won not too long ago. Arkansas was one pitch away from winning a national championship a few years ago, and, and the guy couldn't get to a pop-up against Oregon State. I remember that, yeah. I mean, that's, that's just how good – it is. So it's a grind. But it, uh, these guys are grinders. Interestingly, I get all these coaches that come in studio. Trisha Ford, Brian Corton yesterday, Garrett Chadwell, Jamie Morrison. I get all these guys that come in the studio, and ladies, I should say. And they all talk about, like, that's why we're at the SEC, because every team is good. Yep. That's the point. You know, everybody puts a lot of uh, resources and a lot of enthusiasm into their sports programs. Yeah. And I love that. I do, too.
Uh, if you want to be a part of the conversation this morning, you can do it multiple ways. You can call us. You can text us. Both work. 979-693-1150. If you call, we'll take your call. We'll chat with you. We can talk a little Aggie football. They had practice yesterday. Um, we can talk a little Aggie baseball. You name it. We've got it for you here. 979-693-1150. That is Coffee Talk presented by Texags Coffee. Beat the hell out of mornings by going to texags.com slash coffee. Let's go around the room and say hello to the people out there. We go behind the glass and we say hello to Nick Savage. Nick, good morning. Howdy, good morning, y'all. What's up, buddy? Yeah, I'm worried about that South Carolina series, too. I think we heard both Coach Schlossenagle and Tom Hart mention it, but there have been 21 SEC baseball series so far through the first three weeks of conference play, and only four of the road teams have won the series. So, yeah, that that's the, the biggest concern going into uh, you know South Carolina this weekend. So... I'm in the same boat as y'all, but every time, like even the game yesterday, I was like, "Man, Texas State is a good mid-major. I, I hope they can. They, I hope they show up and they run rule them." So they they continue to surprise us, but uh, yeah, it's going to be a tough one going into uh, Columbia this weekend. But I feel pretty good, especially little, with Braden Montgomery on my team. I panicked a little bit. I think it was the second inning when the bases were loaded, and I'm like, "Uh oh, you know, we're up four to one, or maybe it was third inning. Whatever inning it was, I was I was getting a little nervous." And uh, Zane Badmiev came in and took care of business. How does he say his last name? Well, the guy on TV said it wrong. I believe it's Badmiev. Bad- Am I right? Badmiev? Yeah. Okay. Badmiev? Does that sound right, Nick? Uh, yeah. I know the guy yeah, on TV said there. it completely wrong. Badmiev. I think I've Bad heard Maiev. Coach, Yeah. We'll anyways. have Ronnie correct us or Zane. Um, I think we're close. He's I think pitching I've pitching like that. They'll just call him Zane. Bad mother. He'll be the best <laughs> Zane in this city. He already is. Yeah, he already is. He already is. All right, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Eric Casares, at one time, ranked number one transfer ever at Texas A&M. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'll take it. I'll Thank take it. Actually, I mean, come, I don't, Braden Montgomery, I'm, I'm trying to live in the footsteps. Coming from Stanford, <laughs> that, doing a really good job let's, for them. Let's talk about the last couple of them. Uh, Dexter Dennis. Dexter Dennis, Boots Radford. Probably ahead of Henry Coleman. My, my dude right here. Yeah. Henry Coleman, probably ahead of my dude. Boots Radford. Dan, yeah. Did you we know? mentioned Daniel Adams. Yeah. Did you know that Dexter Dennis was on the Dallas Mavericks for a little bit this season? He I played did. like one or two games. Yeah, uh, I did. He, I in fact, that. he had a 25-point game. Thanks for listening to the show. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> We've discussed. Uh, no, oh, I didn't know. God, hey, <laughs> Aggie guys don't know. Just kidding with you. Well, David, you were wondering, uh, you couldn't remember the team, but LSU ended up losing to Southern U yesterday in baseball. So it was close. It was. Yeah. It was, was it yesterday or was it... Uh, Monday. It was Monday. Monday, oh, April there 1st. We go. There we go. Hey, maybe it was just their April Fool's joke. They wanted to lose on purpose, you know? Never know. Yeah. Hey, um, I'm not saying this has anything to do with it, but you know A&M's old pitching coach yeah. is at LSU now. I do know that. And you know LSU is, I believe I read, they're walking a lot of people. Hmm. hmm. Well, yeah. I hope they continue to walk a lot of people. Sorry, right. son. Hey, you win a, you win a national championship? It's okay to have an off year and let Texas A&M have this next one. You know, uh, they're, they're such a good program. They figure yeah. they're going to figure it out this year. I hope not. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you, but I'm just it's the SEC, brother. You say that like a pro wrestler. I did. It's the I? SEC, brother. <laughs> Let's go to Eric. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's stay on the topic of baseball season uh, because baseball season means the return of no hitters. We got two of those in back to back days from Monday and Tuesday. Uh, first Monday night professionally with Astros, Rono Blanco in the series openers versus the Blue Jays through a no-hitter. Uh, and then followed by the Aggies pitcher yesterday, Emily Levette and Brooke Vestal Tuesday night at home versus Prairie View. Both players combined to throw a five-inning no-hitter and a 10-0 run rule W. Congrats to the team. Uh, and then, yeah. They needed that, by the way. Yeah, we needed that. Got the stats up there. Uh, and then they lost to LSU over the weekend. Mm-hmm, Good to turn tough the page. series loss, yep. And uh, I guess another run rule W, the, the Aggie baseball. Y'all were talking about them. They also got one midweek game over San Marcos, 12-2, 13 hits, 8 walks, 10 strikeouts. They will continue road trip. Travel to Columbia, three games set against South Carolina. I'm a little worried as well because I was looking at their matchup, and, I mean, South Carolina is 17-1 and one at home, and they beat Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. They swept them at home. So it's going to be a tough series, but I like our momentum going into it. Yeah, I mean, if, if A&M pitches well, they win. It's like the offensive line will be the thing that I go to every time that drives probably Billy crazy. Like, it, it, if middle relief is really good, I, obviously you would love to get some great starting pitching from Ryan Prager in the first game and, and go five, six innings and set it up. But 
If they get good pitching, I think they win because their offense is pretty lethal. It is. And, uh, again, if you, uh, if you wanted it to be easy, you could have stayed in the Big 12. You signed up for this, and you built for it. And um, res- what, what's, what do the coaches always say? Res- respect all, fear none. There you go. There you go. Eric? Yep, so trio of Aggies set to compete at the Augusta National Women's Amateur for Women's Golf. We got Jenny Park, Haley Cooper, and Katiana Fernandez Garcia Pagio. I hope I said oh, that right. Them? Just say Kata. Kata. Yeah, there we go. Uh, three of them all compete. Uh, Sounds like set she to plays compete. in a foursome by herself. She's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Yep, April 3rd through 6th, Champions Retreat Golf Club at Augusta National Golf Club. So good luck to the team. Yep, absolutely. Um, a lot of golf been on the show recently. They're playing well. We got the men's side yesterday. We'll have uh, Garrett next week on the program as well. OB, I got a couple of football topics to get into. All right. Okay. Um, I want to discuss like fan and analyst timelines. Okay. Hmm. Because, and we'll do that in the next segment, but in years past, you could be eliminated from the CFP October 1. I don't know if that's going to be the case moving forward. You, I mean, some teams will be, obviously, but I'm talking about like, so because there are going to be 12 teams in this playoff, like, does that kind of shift the way we look at timelines and eliminating teams? We'll just kind of talk a little bit about that. I got some other football talks to get into as well. Ryan O'Brien's going to be in studio here at 835. Looking forward to talking to uh, Ryan, John Harris after that, Coach uh, Pat Henry, Trisha Ford, Bronny, and uh, Kendall Rogers of D1 Baseball. So we'll hit a break here. We'll come back with some football thoughts and uh, get into your text messages. Right now, though, if your organization or business is looking for an opportunity to engage with Aggies, then you got to check out the Association of Former Students. They bring Aggies of all ages together during events held throughout the year. Marquee events such as Aggie Ring Day, All Aggie Hullabaloo, and The Gathering welcome tens of thousands of guests. So when you go out there, you're going to see nothing but Aggies all over the place. And there's many sponsorship and vendor opportunities available to get your brand in front of all those attendees. All events offer a wide variety of both digital and in-person options to promote your brand, including title sponsorship naming, on-site presence, activation, recognition, and social media posts, and much, much more. There's also advertising opportunities in both the Texas Aggie Magazine and the Aggie News Newsletter, which are seen by over 230,000 people. So if your business is ready to engage, choose a partner with the organization that's been supporting the Aggie Network for over 140 years. For more information on options available through the association, please email sponsorships at aggienetwork.com.
Welcome back into Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers in the Rollo Insurance Studio. That's your jam? Uh, yeah, well, I, I used to be a big fan of Bruce Springsteen. Yeah? Used to. Yeah. Yep. You know the difference is real. I do know that. Yeah. And they're an independent, speaking of Rollo Insurance, by the way, they're an independent insurance company built around educating you on exactly what you're paying for, doing the shopping for you so that you can accomplish all of your insurance goals. Uh, they can write any form of insurance in, to anyone in Texas and several other states. They've got over 50 offices here in the great state of Texas, headquarters on Highway 6, right here in College Station. Call them up, 888 rollo or go to rolloinsurance.com. OB Nuno here. So I, I kind of set up the last chat with, or the last talking point, as we get into this 12-team playoff, right, and it's going to be something new for all of us, there was a time that, like, you could, lo- you could have a loss that could basically have eliminate you by the time October starts. And not always the case, but, there, there were, but now some early losses don't necessarily derail you. For example, A&M, uh, the year Johnny Manziel was there, I mean, they would have made the, I don't, they wouldn't have made the 14 playoff, but they were right outside looking in, right? Yeah, I don't even, think, I don't even know if they would have made a 12. In 2012? Point, yeah, at one point. Oh, at one, yeah, yeah, early yeah, on. But they were, but they, were the, they were the hottest team outside they, of the LSU I think game. they were the best team in the country at the end of the season. Yep, yep. I mean, you beat the national champion on their home field. So this year, I think that timetable is delayed. It has to be delayed because yeah. there's more teams. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's for the most part, it's been like if you get two losses, you're eliminated. Yep. And there's going to be two lost teams in, right? So th- that in itself. And, and doesn't the uh, conference champions get in? I believe that is the case, so, yeah. I mean, A&M in 2021 had a chance to win the West uh, even after losing all those games early. You went into November – with a chance to be a 10 team, a 10 win team, right? After that horrific start. Yeah. And if you take care of business, you are a 10. I mean, of course, obviously, but very possible taking care of business, right? I think you got robbed of one win uh, at LSU. You got robbed. Yeah. Okay. And then Ole Miss, just a two drive situation ruined that whole momentum. Well, and they started the game poorly, too. Yeah. There's a lot of things coaching wise they could have done to make them better and start with just feeding the ball to uh, each chain the whole game. But, but okay, that's in the – but the point is that they would have gone into November despite losing um, two games early with an opportunity to um, – with a good opportunity so to, I'm lo- to, to, to play for a, a conference championship. And if you win it, you're in the tournament. I'm looking at last year's football rankings. Not that this would tell you which teams make the, the playoffs, but just for record's sake – because you like obviously Penn State lost to Ole Miss in the bowl game. They're ten and three. They were number thirteen in the country. They would have made. They would have been in the mix for the playoffs. They had two losses. LSU at ten and three last year. I believe they won their bowl game, right? Yeah, they beat Wisconsin. Right. So as a th- as a three loss team, would they 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 were number twelve in the country at the end of the year. They could have potentially been knocking on the door of the playoffs. Well, just look at the previous year with LSU. Yep. They came to A and M thinking, okay, we, if we beat A and M, then we can beat. Uh, Georgia and get in with a two lo- with two losses because w- based on a win over Georgia. Yeah, of course it didn't work out for them. Did not work out for them. You know why? Because they gave the ball to A chain a lot. <laughs> I'm never gonna get over it. You there's certain things that I can I can get down with Ob that like <laughs> you go with the hot hand, buddy. You go with the hot hand. He was without a doubt the best player, and they didn't they still underused him. Texas, a couple of losses. They made the, t- the playoffs anyway. They had a, one loss heading into the playoffs. So, But you're looking at this, like, and a team like Georgia, who was outside looking in, under the 12-team playoff, oh. I think they win it all. I do think they beat Michigan. Well, what they would have had is, I guess, more time to get uh, Bowers and McConkey a little healthier and yep. play with those guys. So, yeah. Oregon, a two-team lo- uh, two, two-loss team, excuse me. Missouri. You might even see a three-loss team get in. Well, and, and that was potentially LSU, potentially mm-hmm. last year, even last year. Um, Oklahoma, I forget that they went 10-3 and three last year. I just think of them being dismal. 10-3 and three in the Big 12 
is different than 10 and 3 in the SEC. 100%. And they're going to find that out. You think Texas finds out soon, too? Yes, I do. This I year? Do. You think yes. they find out this year? Yes. Do you really? Yeah. I like the way you I, I think about, look, and it's not meaning to be a, a big knock at Texas, but it's, it's just a fact. And if you'll go back and look at Texas last year, they're on the verge of losing to Kansas State. They're on the verge of losing to UH. Yeah. Uh, they went into, ha- into the fourth quarter, I think, tied with Wyoming, who had a backup quarterback. Yep. And there were some other games. And I think Kansas was on their backup quarterback when they – Might have been. It seems like – did they have a close game with TCU? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, they did have a close game with so TCU. So all I'm saying is that those close games, if you're, if you're not playing well, if you're not playing to your best – you become much more vulnerable absolutely than you do in the Big 12. It's the SEC is not nearly as forgiving yeah, as the Big 12 and that's what they're going to learn. Unfortunately, and we've probably done this before. I'm looking at their schedule and I think they might be undefeated might heading into the Georgia game. They might be. Colorado State at Michigan. Look, I as of today, I don't buy Michigan because it's completely different. New coach, mm-hmm. new quarterback, new defensive play. Like, the whole thing's different. Yeah. All right. It, but it is at, a, at a Ann Arbor. You got UTSA. You got Monroe. Then you host Mississippi State. Mm-hmm. Like, and then you get Oklahoma, which that, that game can go either way, right? right? You host Georgia, of course. Of course you host course Georgia. You, you go to Vanderbilt. Okay, come on. Yeah, the—, the, the um. The SEC did as many they did, favors yeah. for Texas as they could. You go to Vanderbilt, you host Florida. I know we're we're playing Florida too on the road, but at Arkansas, mm-hmm. like I'm having a hard time seeing some losses here. Ob, right. what I'm saying is though, they're if they continue this trend that they have of yeah. three or four games not playing to their, you know, at their best, that even those games. Uh, you can you can lose. I can remember Arkansas as bad as they were, damn near beat uh, LSU a couple of years ago. That's true. You know, you're so, exactly right. So it, it, again, it's just not as forg- In fact, it was a really bizarre call that went against Arkansas that kept them from beating LSU. Now, see, that's and that's another thing. Th- those those controversial calls that seem to always go Texas way in the. Uh, in won't necessarily 12? go yeah, that way in the yeah, SEC. Probably not. Those go to Alabama. So, to localize it and make it about A&M, I believe A&M will be in the conversation for a playoff spot November 1st. A conversation. Doesn't mean they're going to be one of the top 12 teams in the country. I'm saying they'll be in striking distance at that point yeah, with I, what's left on the schedule. I could see that. And, you know, maybe on September 1st we'll feel that way. Yeah. Because they're they're going to come in as probably significant underdogs to you think it'll be significant. Day. Well, what touchdown? Yeah, uh, and yet I, I'm really uh, and talent wise. I think A and M is going to match up with everybody. They, talent was never the issue. So if you can get with better coaching why? to Missouri undefeated, and that's a big if, by the way, because you haven't won on the road forever. Different coach, different philosophy. It's going to feel different. I get it. But as of right now, they haven't won on the road since 21. So you have, that means Notre Dame beating them at home, which I think you should do. I don't care if it's a new regime. You should beat Notre Dame based on what I think Notre Dame really is and where I think a and is trending. But it'll be tough. You got on the road at Florida. You got Arkansas. That, that's always a tough matchup at Jerry World for some reason, that, those games. And then... On October the 5th, you're taking on Missouri. Can you be a one loss heading into that Missouri game? Um, you could be undefeated. Could have a couple losses. Could have a couple losses. It, you know, I've said about this A&M team, it's, it's fine to be cautiously optimistic. I, have, I can find many reasons to be cautiously optimistic, and sometimes not even cautiously. And yet, we talked about Missouri. Yep. You got to have the Missouri approach. Show me. Show me. And, and that's what Ag Engineering 12 says. I love the optimism, but I'll believe it when I see it with this yeah. team. And I'm with you. But I'm talking possibilities based on my emotions today. My emotions today is A&M is going to be a better team. And Notre Dame is the big if. And, and I think Florida is an if, too, to start the season. I'm talking about the September part of the schedule. Florida is an if. Regardless of what you think of Billy Napier and what they're doing over there, it's an if to go on the road and win the SEC. 
It's true. It is an if, a, a big if, to beat a probably top 15 Notre Dame team at home. Yes. Notre Dame will probably be in the top 15, oh, right? Probably top 10. Okay. A&M will, if they're ranked 24th, probably not start the season ranked. If they're ranked, it'll be probably between 20 and 25. Yeah. If, if they're ranked. So you're not going to be expected to beat Notre Dame. And then you might not even be ranked when you go to Florida on the road against a team that is looking to fire their coach. <laughs> but if they have early success, does it give them a little breathing room? So while I think the optimism comes from, I think we're, we fixed a lot of our issues. I think we, the A&M has done that. Now, as you've said many times, Show me that you fix those issues, and then show me that November 1st will be in the conversation. Well, I certainly like my quarterback. Um, I'm open-minded to the offensive line. Uh, the, I feel good about the receivers. Not great. Good. Glad. I, I, th- I think I feel okay. Yeah, I feel okay. So, same with the running backs. I keep waiting for somebody to emerge and – and show them so that, okay, I'm the guy. I think Reuben Owens. And yeah. I think that's likely to be Reuben, Reuben Owens in and the second year. Monday, uh, Billy talked about Le'Veon Moss looking really good, too. But, but yeah, like I said, what, uh, but you, you need a guy to really show that, hey, I'm, I'm not just, just good, I'm great, right? Or I'm not just serviceable. Uh, I think the defensive line is going to be really good strong, strength of the team. I think the safeties are good. I think they have at least one really good linebacker, and we'll see about the other linebacker and the safeties. So let's I mean let's, the corners. Let's do this. Let's play this game real quick before we hit a break. We're late for a break. If you win the games you're supposed to, right? Will you be in the conversation November first? And here are the games that you're supposed to win: McNeese. I think you're supposed to win Florida. Okay. Bowling Green. Mm-hmm. I think you're supposed to beat Arkansas. Mm-hmm. That's four wins right there. I think you're supposed to go on the road and beat Mississippi State. Yeah. Right. Um, and then LSU, I don't know. I don't know if you're supposed to win that, that game. So at that point, you're five and three going into South Carolina on the road. Should win. Okay. Then you have New Mexico State. That's a win. Okay. Uh, unless you're Auburn. So now you're at seven and three. With two games at Auburn hosting Texas, are you in the conversation when Texas comes under that scenario? So you're saying they're eight and three. I don't know if you're in the conversation at eight and three. I don't know. You're going to have to beat good teams. Yep. So I would think if you are, but would you take that scenario eight and three heading into the Texas no. game? You want more? No. There's that. There's enough talent on this team that you shouldn't concede anything. And uh, that with better coaching, that team wins a, wins ten games last year. Yeah, it wasn't a talent issue. It was a it was a you can screw off and we don't care kind of issue. And let me just before we had a break because I think Cat somebody just said um, on the on the chat this cat looks like some of the dumb mistakes that A and M has made over the last couple of years, and some of those are like like paper cuts, right? A thousand paper cuts. I don't think you're going to have the revolving door at defensive line. I don't <laughs> think you're going to have cornerbacks who don't turn around. I think you're going to have a better defense. And that alone gives me hope. And the defense was, at times, really good last year. But you could throw on them. I think it's going to be harder to throw on the Ags this year. Let's hope. I don't think you'll, uh, you, you won't try to get to the quarterback like they did against Miami. Yep. Dumb it. Uh, uh, what? Pardon? Ag Engineering 12 says 9-3 and three probably doesn't make the playoffs with the auto bids. You're probably right. But again, in the conversation, potentially. We'll see. All right, let's hit a break here. We'll come back. Ryan O'Brien is going to be in studio. Right now we're talking about Heritage Films. The website is yourheritagefilm.com. Check out the website, yourheritagefilm.com. They make documentary films about families, family business, family ranch, family patriarch, family whatever. Right? They can tell your family story in a two-hour documentary form in the most uh, – awesome Q&A kind of dialogue that you can imagine. Chance is uh, just an awesome dude who knows how to bring out the best in people and tell their story. He did my father's documentary. And look, my dad's still kicking. 
uh, working at the golf course after what happened this uh, year when he had to have a hip replacement surgery just a couple months back, already going back to work. I don't wish, I wish he didn't, but he's back out there, right? And we get to tell his, my dad's story, so then my kids and grandkids get to hear his story later on. Two-hour documentary. You don't want to miss time. You also have a year flex option, which is great. The younger kids out there, sixth grader, you want to tell their story, Q&A form. You can do it, uh, benchmark video to when they're freshmen in high school to college. It is awesome. The website is yourheritagefilm.com, We're back here on Tech Tags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. Appreciate everybody listening in. OB's here with me. Go, uh, go Hour. Ryan O'Brien's in the house. What's up, Ryan? How you doing, David? Good to see you, brother. Good to see you, man. So uh, you and Nick were exchanging some commentary about uh, he, he does the play-by-play for Rudder. You're obviously there all the time. How's that treating you? Man, it's pretty good. I mean, we have great kids there, um, led by our head coach, uh, Eric Ezar, and he's a, it's a great man. I've learned a lot from him. It's my fourth year there. Um, I just love that the kids are just – they're willing to be coached at this point, and we got a good program in there right now. So it's its really good things. I expect us to have a, a really good season coming up. So, Ryan, I, before we get started, I know we got a camp to talk about. I wanted to kind of talk about your journey and kind of revisit how you got to A&M. Yeah. How did you end up at A&M? Tell us about your story. 
Yeah, so uh, my mom, uh, uh, she uh, reached out to local colleges um, after uh, during high school because I wasn't recruited heavily. I was playing so many positions uh, at all D Nimitz. And uh, uh, Texas A&M, the recruiting uh, coordinator, told us to come down and check us out. And uh, we got an opportunity to walk on as a preferred walk on. And uh, man, it was a it was a challenge uh, because I remember that first summer um, I came, the whole team, and this was like with uh, Reggie McNeil and uh, Appel and, and all those guys, and I'm running the, the walk-ons, the freshman walk-ons are running the opposite way from the rest of the team for some sort of compliance rule. So everybody's running like north. And it's like eight of us running south for like a okay. hundred yards. Uh, so. Well, that doesn't sound like an NCAA <laughs> thing, right? Right. Of course it does. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I just I just thank God that um, he took me a very long way because to be able to do that, and then uh, with the new coach, with the coaching change with Mike Sherman, um, he, he saw he mean saw me in a different light, and I was able to uh, be the twelfth man my junior senior year able to earn a scholarship. My senior year, I actually won the highest award you can win, called the Aggie Hart Award. Yep. And, uh, man, I just thank God that he allowed me to go through that journey because I was able to learn so much about people, you know, and how to overcome adversity. And uh, I tell people, you know, I tell our kids at Rudder, uh, kids I train, you know, it's not about how you start, but it's how you finish. And if you are an underdog, it's actually a blessing because you 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 you're able to develop a um, a chip on your shoulder. You develop a, a callus that makes you that will help you be successful in the rest of your life. If you're given if you're given too much stuff, I mean, sometimes it'll mess up how you process, how you work hard. So it's a blessing, man. So. I thank God for that. Sounds like you listen to David Goggins with callousing your mind out there. I, I like that. Uh, and I got to say this, OB, typically, I'm the one wearing a schmedium in the studio, but Ryan O'Brien has not missed a bicep day since 1986. Nope, looked, like, looked like he came out of the womb right? pumping iron. Like, when's the last time you missed bicep day? Do you do it on the daily? Well, you know what? I try to make sure I, I stay ready. You know, yeah. so you got to stay ready so you don't got to get ready. So uh, That's great. Hey, and you were permanent team captain as well? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I was uh, blessed with that honor. It was uh, three other three other folks which uh, in 2009, which, man, that's a huge honor. And like I was saying, um, those – I was when I was growing and coming up, I was always wondering why would stuff happen to me? Like why would positive things happen, you know? And I realize now in my life that those things happen so I can bless other people, yeah. you know? So I'm able to tell my kids whether I'm training, um, you know, little league kids that I'm playing, uh, that I'm coaching or at, at school. I'm like, hey, I was able to do these things. So they listen, but now I can have something positive that they can be able to like to put in them because they can say, oh, okay, he accomplished this. He was a permanent team captain, you know, at Texas A&M or he was – you know, he won the highest award, or he's able to do this, and now I can listen to him, so I can see how, you know, how God works. He he, he works in a mysterious ways. Yeah, for sure. yeah, I'm sure your kids are. You got what, five of them. Yes. Yeah, I'm yes. sure they're proud. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's where all the biceps come from, having to pick them up all day. How? What are their ages? Um. So uh, my oldest, Jordan, just turned eight. Zion, he's about to turn seven in a couple couple weeks, and uh, Sophia's five. Joshua's three, which he's the toughest guy in our family. He doesn't cry at right. all. He's a, and then I got a one year old Sophia. So, <laughs> Ryan, since you're here, do you get to keep up with what's happening across the street and Coach Elko and whatever's going on over there? Yeah, um, it's it's really cool to see uh, a couple of the guys I've I've had some sort of interaction with throughout their life. A couple of uh, uh, Brian High uh, kiddos I've been able to. I work with over a couple of years, so it was really cool to see them and a couple other uh, kids over there. So I keep up, but I'm a huge a and football fan. I, I always tell people um, my two biggest sports loves are a and football and whatever it is my kids do. I'm huge fans of those things. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're super optimistic of what's happening over there. Do you find yourself in that point or are you kind of like oh, both of us or show me first, right? <laughs> 
I I, uh, I was uh, talking with uh, the uh, the f- the famous Stuart Wade with the uh, Texas. Stuart Wade, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think I have battered. Uh, what's it, Aggie bat- BAS. battered? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I'm kind of like optimistic, but it's like, hey, we kind of wait and see. But I tell you what, man, I I personally don't. I I don't find a, a better joy than to watch the Aggies play. Mm-hmm. So even if like we're you know six and five and we're playing a home game and there's a hundred thousand people there, I get a lot of joy watching that, taking my my kids there. But I tell you what, I haven't heard one negative thing about the new coaching staff. I mean, I I have a young man, um, Jaquise Martin, who's uh, he's a big time player uh, over at Rudder, and he's getting uh, recruited by AM, so Good. he's up there. And talking to those coaches, he has nothing but great things to say. Um, and I, I know they have a really quality staff, quality people. I know Elko is a, is a football guy. And I think when you have football guys there, it's, it's, it's no telling what can happen because they understand the game of football. Ryan, talk to me about your business and the camp that's coming up. Yeah, so um, a couple years ago, um, I came up with the idea of uh, – the, uh, of my speed and agility business. Um, it's called Jara Fitness. Uh, it basically means um, uh, Jara, God will provide. Um, so God will provide, uh, whether it is, you know, motivation to, to train or whatever the needs that you have. And that's kind of the center around it. It's to improve the lives of youth around uh, Brazos Valley through fitness. Um, that's, our, that's our mission. And I've been doing a, doing a great job. We hold sessions um during each season of the year um from six weeks to eight weeks uh we'll have another one coming up uh eight week season starting uh the first week of uh, may um and we basically just whether the kids from four years old all the way up to about 12 12 13 uh from elementary to that middle school age and we just we love on them uh show them how to run properly help them move uh better um, I learned a lot from just training my my own kids, right? Um, and seeing how they were being, how they were able to be successful during those movement patterns that I learned through um, after I finished at A and M and uh, played some minor league football and 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 trying to trying to make it professionally. Uh, I learned a lot, and I got really um, knowledgeable on how to improve your athletic performance, um, and also. People like Coach Whitehead, who's a legend in our uh, community for his training, um, and also uh, Pat Henry learned a lot from him. Uh, I was able to train with uh, the track and field team for about four uh, four years, just learning uh, how to run properly um, uh, while I worked here as a in the athletic department. So awesome! Yeah. And then the camp is a football camp that's coming up. Yes, yes, uh, David. Um, it's a football camp um, that. It's free. Um, it's Sunday, April 14th. Uh, we have uh, uh, the four to seven year olds. They go from 1 p.m. to 1.45 p.m. And uh, the eight to about 12, 13 year olds, um, they are going to go from 2 to 2.50 p.m. over at Travis Fields in, um, in Midtown Bryan. Um, it's completely free. So the, so the, the goal is to just uh, engage the community, the young kids. Um, I think that's something that we we lack in our uh, Brazos Valley is just opportunity for kiddos to learn the game, get better at it. Um, I'm blessed to have some really quality men who played college football with us to be uh, some of our uh, counselors during the camp. Um, uh, we have a guy, a couple guys who played in NFL as well. Um, so we're just really uh, grateful for them. And this is an opportunity to just engage with the community um, for them to, to learn and just get to know what we're all about. So. And uh, people want to sign up. Do you need to sign up before you go, or can you just show yeah, up? Yeah, they need to sign up before they get there so we can have numbers. We were able to partner with uh, HEB, uh, Tower Points, so uh, Charles. Charles. Mr. Charles. Yes. Everybody knows Mr. Charles. <laughs> He's the best. He may he? be the most famous guy in College Station. Yeah. So a guy uh, from Brennan. God bless him. So Charles, uh, a couple of uh, great uh, other uh, people, they've been able to help donate to our camp to help with shirts and uh, facility fees. So um, they have been a blessing as well. 
Um, and so we're, just, we're, we're ready to rock and roll, honestly. Um, just wanted to come and just try to engage, I mean, other people to come as, 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 they, uh, as they see fit. But they need to sign up so we can have uh, numbers. Uh, we'll have free food, uh, free T-shirts, uh, camp shirts, um, have some other giveaways, some other goodies for them. So. What's the website again? Uh, so it's my name.com. So it's okay. ryanobryant.com. And uh, you'll see the link for our uh, football camp. Um, and then you'll be able to sign up. Uh, scroll down, you'll see be able to sign up for it. And it's like I said, it's completely free. So Ryan, I appreciate you coming in, man. Hey, thank you so much, David. OB, appreciate you. Thank you. Great opportunity. Yes. Yeah, yeah, make sure you all go. All right, let's hit a break here. We have a short segment coming back on TechSax. All right, we got about, I don't know, a minute and a half left. Texax Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Rollo Insurance Studio, the Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. Maroon never looks so good with Maroon New. He's OB. I'm David Nuno. OB, uh, we're on uh, Commit Watch. Mm -hmm. Landon Rink at 9 a.m., uh, defensive lineman out of Cyprus, uh, out of the Cypress area, is going to be committing here at 9 a.m., and we're hoping, Cypher, uh, we're hoping that he picks Texas A&M. Uh, looks good. But his dad did play at Texas, at, at Texas so. Yeah. But he's a big old kid, like a, a big, big, yeah, wide kid. I'm looking at his uh, profile pictures to see if he had put anything out there. I forget Cypher's colors are A and M's colors, yeah. maroon and white. So there's no reason to change. Just keep it going, dude. You know, you can be here, be home, mom, do your laundry in in an hour. 
Even less. Yeah. Well, will you drive? Factor in. By the way, I drive. You can get there in about Dude, 40 minutes. Uh, like, there was one point on the drive <laughs> to Memphis where I think I was going, I don't know, <coughs> speed limit was 70. I was maybe going 68 because there was a car in front of me. And Obi's like, Dude, what are you doing, Grandma? And then when he drove, 87 in a school zone. Okay, it's it wasn't true. a school zone. It was, 80, <laughs> it was 87, though. I might have hit 87 for long, long stretches. I'm trying to get out of Arkansas. Who can blame me? <laughs> Thank you, OB. Bet. When we come back, we'll keep a, an eye on Landon Reek's uh, commitment here. Hopefully, it's Texas A&M. John Harris will be joining us. We'll have uh, Trisha Ford in the hour. We'll have Pat Henry in the hour. And, of course, we'll get to your text messages at 979-693-1150. You're listening to Tech Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. All right, we're back here on Tech Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. I am uh, refreshing Twitter, so hopefully we'll find out about 
Landon Rink's uh, commitment here in the next few minutes out of uh, Cypher. We'll find out if he picks a and Sex Hags Radio, we are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's go to the hotline. John Harris, the professor from uh, the Houston Texans, their sideline reporter, and, of course, footballtakeover.com with us. Johnny, good morning, buddy. Uh, good morning. Yeah, that dude could play. He can absolutely play. He's a stud. Um, got a chance to see him play uh, in a playoff game. They got rolled. I think it was North Shore they were playing. Um, but Cy Fair had some dudes last year. They had a couple of receivers. Um, but Mize kept coming to number eight, uh, playing uh, on the defensive line. I don't know how, where he'll develop. He's kind of a tweener right now, like weight-wise, like 265, 270. So is he a tackle? Is he an end? I don't know. But I, I know that dude can play for sure. How do you know everybody, John? Like, this, it's not fair to have a brain, a recall. Like, you know his jersey number. And you, you work yeah. in the pros. You study the college guys. And you know all the high school kids, too? So, well, here's what, here's what happens. And, and I don't know if, I don't know if Ryan, Ryan was there that day. I've run into Ryan at, you know, the NRG always has that day where they always have the, um, the playoff games where they'll have like three of them in a day, which is great. It's like right in my office. So I just walk down a tunnel and I've seen Ryan a couple of times. And I, it's great because I don't know the guys. Most of the time, I don't know them by name. I just look at the numbers and go, okay, who's eight or who's 44? Like there was one time that Ryan helped me out. We were watching Huntsville High School play. They were playing a playoff game on a Friday night, and I you know, I watched for just – you can watch a high school game for two minutes and go, okay, that guy's the stud, he's the stud. Well, sometimes it's just physical appearance, and sometimes you just watch and go, okay, that guy's amazing. So I was watching Huntsville High School one night, and I see number 44, and he's a good-looking kid. And I say to Ryan, Ryan, who's that? And he goes, oh, that's Tavondre. I was like – to Vondre, as if I don't know. And I, because I don't know. He goes, Oh, it's to Vondre Sweat. Sorry. To Vondre Sweat. Oh, okay. 44, like 6'5, like 265. I mean, when you've seen players for a long time, you kind of get a, a little, you get a gauge on the weight. And so I'm like, That's a good looking player. Well, yeah, I turned into to Vondre Sweat, the University of Texas. So last year, Cy Fair, it was either, I think it was North Shore they were playing. And I was looking forward to that. And so I'm watching the game, and, and I had seen Cy Fair play just kind of preparing for the game. I'd watched the game the, the week before against Katie. And I'm like, man, there are players all over the place. And I was like, who's this number eight? So, of course, at that point, I look it up. Like, okay, eight, rink. All right, just keep an eye on that guy. Well, against North Shore, he's the only guy making plays defensively. North Shore is doing whatever it wants, but he's the only guy making plays. And so I just, I just remembered. I was like, man, that, guy, that guy's a stud. I got to keep an eye on that guy. Oh, he's a junior. Oh, he's still got one more year. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, he'll probably grow a little bit more. I'm curious where they'll play him. Um, and then you start looking at, okay, where are some of the schools that are looking at him? And, and at the time, I don't remember seeing, being able to find that. So um, I'm glad that A&M is in, because he is an athlete. Well, he can really, for a guy that size, what he can grow into, man, that's impressive. He's going to be fun to watch. Talking to John Harris here on Texas Radio. John, I know we, uh, you've done some video breakdowns of these uh, NFL prospects at footballtakeover.com, and you can go to YouTube, your YouTube page, and find some really good analysis out there. I, I, I don't think you've done Layden Robinson. I know you've done Edger and Cooper. But when you think about Layden and his potential future in the NFL, tell me some things that pop out. It's interesting, you know, you know talking with, with Luch, uh, with Billy, you know, Billy, I can I always go up pro day. I always love going up there. It's always a fun drive for me. And so I love getting up there. And, you know, so I made my way over to, to Billy and, you know, obviously it was the, um, you know, it was after the SEC basketball tournament, I believe it was. And so we talked about, you know, Aggie basketball and what they were doing. And um, I'm sorry for the door slam there. And so the, uh, we're talking about that. And then, you know, right as we were kind of finishing that discussion, Layden was doing his workout like right underneath us. We were up on that catwalk, which, by the way, that indoor facility is unbelievable. For Aggies, I haven't seen it yet. Oh, my God. That place is incredible. Um, and what they're building. Jeez. So I'm watching. And so Layden Robinson, like length, you know, that stands out. Just body composition. And you feel like you're looking at a pretty good athlete. And I think I asked him, I said, Billy, he lost a little bit of weight. And he goes, yeah, I think he has. So he's kind of slimmed down a little bit. Now, that doesn't put him in a tackle conversation. But I think what it did was it allowed him to show his movement skills. 
I think his movement skills are really, really good. And then Billy said something I thought was interesting. He goes, you know, he's got to, you know, he's got to get better coach than he was here the last couple of years. And I said, okay. And I did the math on it. It's like he had a, he had a different O-line coach in 2021 than he had in 22 and 23. Right. Is that right? Billy is. Yeah. And I was like, man, it makes sense. It's like, sometimes you got to put the puzzle pieces together because I thought in 2021, I thought I was watching a top 50 player in the NFL draft. I point blank in the story. I thought I was watching that player. In 2022, 2023, I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, I thought I was watching a day three guy. Even at the senior bowl, I'm kind of watching. You know, there were, there were decent moments, but, but I really thought there was a lot more there. And then Billy said that, and it, it kind of clicked for me, like, hey, wait a second. Okay, coaching matters. It matters a lot. And so it got me thinking about, man, he's got all the physical tools. He moves well. He was doing a drill at Pro Day where he was he was pulling. They had a pull drill. It's easy. You just, you know, get a right-hand stance, boom, pull your left. Left-hand stance, pull your right. Then he would switch it. And you're watching him move. And I just thought, man, how can that guy right there not be a top 100 pick? And then I go back and I think about, man, the things he struggled with in 2022, just staying latched on blocks, you know, his footwork and everything is technique. And I was like, man, that's all coachable stuff. And then I watched Layden at the very end of it. Walk up to every scout, the guy that worked him out, shook his hand, shook his hand, walked through. I was like, how is that guy not going to end up being a player in the NFL? And I mean, by player in the NFL, I mean a guy that's there eight to ten years, settles right in at left or right guard, whichever guard spot, um, and eventually becomes becomes a player. Because what I saw was at Pro Day was an athletic big man who can move that was showing he's coachable but also that he wants to be great. And those guys typically, as long as they can avoid the injuries, end up being guys that can play in the league. Now, maybe not right away because, you know, with draft picks and where a guy gets drafted, sometimes that can get political in certain places. Sometimes it's just we're going to play the best guy. So it kind of depends. But it got me thinking about the the coaching that he wasn't getting for those two years in 22-23 because the guy, like I said, I was watching in 21 – that's a dude that could step right in and make some make some hay in an offensive line and be a draft pick that people can be very, very happy with. And I see a lot of the sites that are, well, he's in the, I think PFF has him like 250 or something like that. And I was like, that's ridiculous. That guy's an athlete um, that can move and has strength, has length, has a lot of things you're looking for in an offensive lineman. It's just a matter of getting to the right spot where you can get coached up um, and getting past all of that. I think a Trey Smith. Now, I don't think Layden's quite the player Trey Smith was. And Trey had a lot of that had to do with his medicals. And there were a lot of things when he's coming out of Tennessee that people didn't believe in. And when we got to the second, third round, and I knew the Texas needed to guard interior players, I was like, Trey Smith, Trey Smith, yes, as long as the medicals are okay. Well, Trey Smith has gone to Kansas City, become one of the best guards uh, in the league in no time flat. I'm not saying Layden Robinson gets there, but I'm saying if Layden gets in a good situation where he can get good offensive line coaching, He's eventually going to play, be a player somewhere. Hey, John, I do want to interrupt quickly. Uh, Landon Rink has picked Texas A&M, so he is officially uh, committed to Texas A&M. If you're not a premium subscriber, you're missing out on some great intel. Ryan Broniger just wrote up uh, something a few minutes ago. It's already up on the site, ready to roll, so uh, go become a premium subscriber there at texags.com. All right, Johnny, let's, let's kind of do some more f- film evaluation. We'll, we'll jump around. It doesn't have to be just A&M players. Uh, Michael Penix, he's a guy that I think a lot of people are excited about what he could be at the NFL level, but there's still some skepticism. When you watch him, what do you see? Well, I think there's skepticism. There's a couple, there's a couple areas. Number one is the, uh, the medicals. He had four straight years and not finishing a season with injuries at, at Indiana. Uh, number two, you know, throwing mechanics, his throwing mechanics are weird. They're odd. And if, they're, if a team is sitting there thinking, well, we're going to change his mechanics – you're going to screw him up. He, he does, it, it, it's odd how he uses lower body. Sometimes he doesn't use it at all. Sometimes it's all just hip torque and left arm. So there, there's, when, when I know people that have been around the game, they see that and they're like, well, that guy's not going to be successful because, well, if you're that way mechanically, well, you can't throw the ball accurately. And that was one of the things I think that really kind of from, you know, when he started his career through 2022, you saw, you saw a lot of that. Like even in 22, when he had a great statistical year at Washington, you still saw him 
wow, he airmailed that by like seven yards. What? The, wow. Um, so there's there's always kind of that. Well, in 2023, he started to kind of rein it in. It was like he started coloring between the lines a little bit more. He was making those throws as accurately as possible. He throws the ball outside the numbers as well as anybody. I mean, obviously, his arm strength. When I was at Senior Bowl, I don't know. I think Josh Allen is the only guy I've ever seen that's got a stronger arm than Penix at the Senior Bowl. So, you know, he's got tools. But it's just with him mechanically, it looks a little different. And he's left-handed. And some coaches just don't like different. Um, he's athletic enough to get out and make plays out of the pocket, but he just didn't do it at Washington. Um, he had so many good receivers, he figured as soon as he started moving and managing the pocket, those guys got open. Um, but I thought he really improved this past year with his accuracy, especially in intermediate areas. I have him in my mock draft at footballtakeover.com. I have him being taken at pick number 27 as the Patriots trade back into the first round. So I had a long story, but I had the, I had the Patriots trading out of three and then picking up picks. I had the Cardinals moving around, and then the Cardinals would pick number 27, which is really the Texas pick, but that was for the Will Anderson deal. So the Cardinals, with obviously the connection to the Patriots, Monty Ossifort, their GM, I had them trading back up in the back end of the first round to take Penix in New England. So New England ends up, ends up taking not a quarterback early because all the quarterbacks are gone, but trading back in the back of the first round to get Michael Penix Jr. So I think New England would be a great spot. You learn from Jacoby Brissett. Uh, Alex Van Pelt, I think, is a really good offensive coordinator. He's a good teacher uh, of young quarterbacks. And so I think Penix would be going to a great spot there. But uh, I think he goes to the back in the first round because there's going to be some team that says, man, we did not get the quarterback early on. All those, those top four guys were gone. We got to go get a guy. Um, and I think a team ends up, um, whether it's the Raiders moving up, whether it's the Patriots moving up that don't take a quarterback early, they go get Penix at the back end of the first round. Why is Drake May dropping? Because he was the one name that was popping up real high, and now he's dropping again. It, it's interesting. I think Drake May kind of, um, that's the right way of saying this, he's sort of a victim of his own competitiveness. There are some throws that Drake May has to know he, he, he can't make. He's got to live to see another down. And he, he'll take some not-so-calculated risks with the football. Um, and that's going to put him in a position where, wow, he should never made that throw. And you see some of the plays he's made, and you're like, he still should have made that throw. There's there's some throwing decisions with him where you go, oh, boy. Um, but, man, I, I, I kind of don't get it. Um, I think he, at 6'4", 220, there are very few guys like him. In fact, I had a hard time really finding a comp for him. David, in, in the summer, I really struggled to find one. And then I watched Jordan Love with the Packers. I was like, that's Drake May's game right there. 6'4", 220, agile, can move out of the pocket when he needs to, very creative throwing um, and throwing decisions, kind of go through the same throwing decisions, very similar. So I was like, man, you like Jordan Love? Well, I did. And obviously it speaks to why I like Drake May. I just think he comes from an athletic family. His brother was a, a power forward at North Carolina, hit a big shot against Kentucky to go to a Final Four one year. So he's got a ton of athletes. Through to Moose and Muhammad. Uh, in high school, was coached by Josh McCown, Myers Park High School there in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. So I don't know what people are, are – I mean, I think that's it with Drake May. But as far as where he throws the football, how well he throws it, how composed he is for a guy that size to move that way, uh, I I mean, his offensive line last year was absolute garbage. And he still he still kept them in games that they probably didn't deserve to be in. I like all these quarterbacks. I really do. And I know not all of them are going to be successful, but I feel like Drake May is kind of taking the heat for some reason. And I think that's it because there are some questionable decisions when it comes to that, because he's just trying to, he doesn't, you got to know when the journey is over. And sometimes he doesn't know when the journey is over. Uh, I think that hurts him, but if he gets in the right system and right coaching and they can coach some of those things out of them, I think you can with competitive guys. I think you can get them to like rein it in. It might take a little while, Josh Allen had to do that. And Josh still has moments where he goes back to being at Wyoming. But, man, Josh Allen is a – he's a mother trucker, man. He is so tough to prepare for because of all the different things he can do. I think Drake can do a lot of those things as well. Johnny, any big takeaways from the LSU Pro Day? I think you were watching that one. Yeah, Malik is a stud. I mean, he's just so – you know, the, the word I like to use is sudden. Uh, I think that's one of the things, you know, I watch – I watch as much as I possibly can. I see a lot of these, you know, that dude destroying who's now kicking in the in the XFL or UFL or whatever it's called now. 
And he would do these videos where he goes out and he has these one-on-one wide receiver versus DB things, and he gets, like, millions of views, and it's just brilliant. But I watch these these receivers, and they try to do all these and-one moves and, like, all this kind of stuff, and I'm like, just run your route. Just explode off the ball, make one move, and go. You have to be sudden. You have to have that off the line script. You can't, like, step back and do all these, you know, and-one shakes and hezzies and all that kind of stuff. You got to do it as you go. The NFL is way too fast. Malik Neighbors, every route I watched him at LSU, it was like that. It was, if he was going to use a shimmy at the line of scrimmage to shake you, it was, and go. You know, if he was going to, you know, if he, if he was going to get up on your toes, you know, if he was running a deeper route, he's going to get on your toes and make you make the wrong decision. And then he was going to break, hitch up, whatever it might be. 42-inch vert, I mean, six foot, 200, basically. He's perfect size. He plays in the slot. He plays outside. Uh, runs very good routes, gets separation, strong, really good after the catch. And I think that's one of the things, you know, watching Nico Collins do that here, he was incredible after the catch. Obviously, Nico's bigger, 6'4", 220, but, you know, that's become a really big part of the game. Hey, we can get this 10-yard catch, but you need to turn that into a 25-yard gain. And, and the receivers that are able to do that more now – are becoming more valuable than ever before. And I think Malik Neighbors has definitely got that. Look, I, the wide receiver, man, the wide receiver position at the top three, you know, people, oh, what are your top three receivers? Top, how, do you, how do you rank them? Like, I don't know how you rank these three. Marvin Harrison Jr.'s like plastic man. I mean, his body control is ridiculous. Roma Dunze has been one of my favorite receivers for the last three years. I've loved him at Washington, have loved him for a while. And then there's Malik Neighbors who probably is as electric and more explosive than the other two. And you could make a case, yeah, all right. Which one are you going to pick? Which one do you want? I'll just say yes, because I think all three of them are going to be super studs. Again, where do they end up? What quarterback is throwing the football? You know, do they get wasted in some respects, which I hope that's not the case. Um, but I think those three will go top 10. It doesn't matter what order they need to go in or they should go in. But neighbors with what he did at, at Pro Day, just, just his testing, just confirmed what we already know. Now, one thing I take umbrage with, he talked about winning the wide receiver battle. I don't think to me, if I'm that if I'm in that mix, I'm like, it don't matter where I, where, you know, oh, do I'm I the first receiver or am I the third receiver? It matters who's throwing you the football. You know, would you rather be the first receiver taken and Carson Wentz is throwing you the football? Or would you rather be the eighth receiver and Patrick Mahomes is throwing you the football? So Winning, winning, as Malik Neighbors said, winning that, that wide receiver one race, who cares? It doesn't matter. It matters where you end up and who you end up with. And obviously, they're good enough where they're going to go high enough. Poor Malik Neighbors probably going to end up with the Giants, with Daniel Jones. That's going to suck. No offense, but that's going to stink. Johnny, last thing for you. There's something came up on the show yesterday that I think you talking about Neighbors, they're kind of um, rigging out of that thought. Can LSU, I mean, can, yes, but... Do you see LSU taking a, a significant step back considering three potential first rounders or because it is LSU and there's certain programs, you know, you just churn and burn. They may take a little bit of a step back, but not as significant, you know, to lose potentially three guys. Here's the thing. If Garrett Nussmeyer is all that and a bag of chips, he'll gloss over, he'll cover up the, the, the holes that are there. He'll be the makeup that covers up, you know, the zits on a face or, you know, whatever the problems are. That's that's the one thing. Nussmeyer can kind of cover up. But if you think about LSU, to me, with you know Campbell and Jones at tackle, I mean those guys. You know Campbell's probably a top ten at this point. Very good player. You know Harold Perkins on the other side. I think you know decent in the trenches. Um, I still think defensively up front, not great, honestly. But you've got Perkins. Um, you know Mason Taylor at tight end. I always feel like teams like LSU, A&M, Texas, you know, all the big teams, seemingly now they just reload. You know, you look at, you know, Texas, and they lose, you know, Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy, and they reload with Matthew Golden and Silas uh, Bolden. Like, not going to be as great, but they're going to be just as. But can Garrett Nussmeyer cover up the, the potholes and the problems? And if he can do that, then LSU will be, will be just fine. I don't think LSU takes a massive, massive step back. But do I feel like it's, you know, it's got a seven and five season club in its bag? Yep, absolutely. Um, because I don't know that it's got as much talent across the board as it's had. And that obviously will reign supreme. Even with Jaden Daniels last year, what were they, nine and three? 
Yep. Nine and three. They won the bowl eight game, four. so ten nine and three. three. Yeah. Um, so even with Daniels, for nine and three regular season. So now a couple things go their way. You know, maybe Daniel stays healthy. Maybe they beat Alabama. You know, who knows? But still, it took a Heisman Herculean effort to get them to nine and three. So now the Heisman guy leaves. Two stud receivers leave. Um, guys up front, you know, Malik Wingo, Jordan Jefferson, they leave. Spates and linebacker leaves. Losing secondary members, a couple of them. Um, oh, boy. It gets kind of nasty. So I think they could take a not huge precipitous fall. I'm not expecting three and nine, but you know, seven and five in the works. I I think so. Unless Nussmeyer just turns into Jaden Daniels 2.0, which I don't see right now. Uh yeah, I think seven and five is definitely in their in their potentially in their future. Johnny, thank you as always, brother. You got it, man. See you, bud. Later, man. John Harris, football takeover.com, Texan sideline reporter. We'll head a break. Coach Henry will join us. We're a little late for that. Apologize moment for Caldwell Country Chevrolet. You can find them on Highway 21 in Caldwell. You can also find them online at CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com. When you go to Caldwell Country Chevrolet, you're going to love the experience. I mean, you start your search online, you see the vehicles that they have, and you get a kind of a feel, a sense for the pricing, the vehicles, and all that good stuff. When you make the commute out there, you're going to be uh, greeted by an awesome sales staff and, and people that just want to give you great customer service because that's what they do there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Customer service is supreme there when you go. And, of course, the great trade-in value, the great uh, pricing, and, of course, the uh, complimentary pickup for all their service customers and delivery, by the way. They'll take care of you here in the Brazos Valley. They are proud supporters of a and Athletics, and they want to help you find the right vehicle for you at the right time. It's not a far drive either. We're talking 15 minutes, the very edge of Bryant to the beginnings of Caldwell. A short conversation away, but you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the great people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. They're on Highway 21, they're in Caldwell, and they're online. CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com.
All right, we're back here on Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. It is now time for our weekly conversation with Coach Pat Henry, brought to you by the Brazos Running Company, your local Aggie-owned specialty running store. Save 10% in store when you mention the code TexAx10, and please go out to that location there at Century Square. Coach Henry, hello, yeah, sir. Good, and I always want to thank those guys for They're great, their aren't they? involvement. Yeah. Mike's awesome those, over there. Those are good guys. So um, let's chit-chat a couple really good weekends in a row. Like you're, I feel yeah. like things are going in a good direction. Well, you know, we always talk, talk about it's, it's like a ladder. You take, a, you take the next step, and the LSU meet was a competitive situation. It put, put, uh, put everybody in a little bit more competitive than the week before, and our people stepped up and did some great things during this, uh, during this competition. We, we had some great oppor- – I mean, we had some great performances. So I'm extremely pleased with the way the group is and, and what's going on right now. I know that – rankings don't necessarily mean i mean they mean something but yeah it's about wh- where you finish and, and whatnot yeah. but uh, i got a note here that uh the men still rank number one and the women move up to number three so right. uh, it's nice when others are noticing what you all are doing well i, I yeah i think it's important i think it that uh, like anybody you know you you guys talk about baseball rankings right now too it's important to the guys on the team how how, how they're ranked and how they're looked at same thing with our group it's the yeah. exact same thing this is the uh, the only difference in ours is it's actually a, a time and or a tape measure mm-hmm. that's that's saying this guy did this and so that that's why he that's why this team is ranked high yeah so there's no subjectivity sam uh we, we talked about him all week i mean just what, yeah. a, what a brilliant performance talk a little bit about what he was able to do with marsh with marsh you know I, I sam has been He's had something go wrong for two years, every, every year. I mean, he's had two heart surgeries mm-hmm. during this time frame. He's had, uh, he, I mean, I, c- I can go down a litany of things. Finally, finally, Sam is healthy, and, well, and I've been waiting for this time frame, and I knew this was going to happen because he, he showed these kinds of things in training. Uh, to run 144... 40 i don't know i got it right here 144 46 in the 800 is is especially this time of the year at this early is just a performance that no one expected to see no one in this country expected to see i mean he leads he leads the country very early donovan brazier is our school record holder at 143 50 plus um but that was done at the NCAA championships at the end, and that's the fastest time ever run, you know. So this, this young man, Sam Whitmarsh, is, uh, is, is going to be uh, one of America's great ones. He's, this is a great athlete. And then we have uh, Jaqueline Scott and Connor Jaqueline, yeah. finishing uh, one and two there in, yeah. the, in the 110 hurdles. And Jaqueline, same way. I mean, he's, he's one of the best hurdlers in the world, as well as – uh, both of these guys are, are running really fast right now. They're they're very competitive with each other, but they're really competitive when it comes to someone else stepping on the track. So uh, they're Texas A and M, and those guys are competitive as as a team. And that's that's what's happening right now. Uh, I'm looking over here, and I'm seeing one of our distance guys sitting over here. The team is coming together. Yep. And that's that's what this is all about right now. Well, I was going to say like. When you get to go against somebody who brings the best of you yeah. out at yeah. practice, yeah. that translates so well competition day. Yeah. Uh, it can get too much sometimes. Yeah. And, and you gotta, you got to figure out how to temper that at times. Um, I was running a training session yesterday, and, and I'm trying to hit a certain time, and I got these two guys. Well, that's why they put blinders on horses. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't want that person to see. They don't want that horse to necessarily see that other horse. Human being is some, sometimes just like that. I got to take, I got to put guys in different, different groups to keep them from being so competitive with the neck, with a certain guy in a certain group. Is that a case by case thing? Because yeah. I feel like I might be at my best in that scenario, but yeah. I can see how that can be detrimental for yeah. you not running your race early on. Yeah, and and some guys that makes when they get when they're competitive, and then they have a guy that's just naturally better than them. And is running better than them, and they're they're running full blast at training. That's not good. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you're working really, really hard just to stay up with the group, uh, that's not a good thing because coming back on Saturday is extremely difficult. 
when you've put all your effort into training right. at, at that level every day. So I have to temper it. Is, um, I think I've asked you this before, but do you all sometimes follow an 80-20 kind of thinking 80% of the time at a certain pace and then 20% almost all out? Well, we never, I mean, people, you know, I work with our quarter miners, but we never run a quarter in practice. Right. It doesn't have anything to do with what we're trying to do. We're trying to develop a posture and, and speed. And so uh, it's very difficult in training to try, to try to replicate some things that happen during a meet and, and, and when, when the gun goes off. So, you know, 80-20, I, I don't really follow that kind of plan. What I follow is... You know, I, I, I've got to be a little bit more individual about it. I've got to figure out what buttons I have to punch mm-hmm. with each certain athlete at this level. And so some guys need a, need a different stimulus than other guys. Yeah, no doubt. Eric, and, what do you and got? And or women. No, yeah. no question. When I'm saying guys, I'm not saying guys. I'm Send saying athletes. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah athletes. athletes. Eric? Yeah, Coach, so we're talking about the great things that Sam did this weekend. Uh, but people don't really get to focus on what happens behind the scenes. And I think... A big thing to note is year one head coach, Paul Aaron, coming in this year, yeah. uh, working under you. How has that been, his process coming over from UTEP to A&M and, and the experience that he has? Yeah, I, I, we, we've hired a, I hired a new guy this summer. Paul Aaron is, uh, is, works with our half miners. And uh, Paul was the Olympic gold medalist and the world record holder at 800 meters. So he has some pretty good knowledge about what's going on. Not all athletes are good coaches. Paul is a good coach, and so he's teaching some different things to some different people. I think personality, as you know, is a little bit different, so uh, I think he's a, a real positive right now for that group. Eric, let's get another one in. Yep, got to mention uh, the Stanford squad that went out, <laughs> produced four personal best. I knew you were going to talk about that Stanford. Seven all t- yeah, yeah, seven all-time marks. I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on the small Because he knows I'm, I, you know, <laughs> I have a hard time with splitting teams. I have a hard time with that whole, that whole scenario because I think that's what we have to change in our sport. we got to change that from happening. Mm-hmm. But to talk about what Eric's talking about, yeah, the, the group did a good job out there. They had an environment that, that was positive for them, and uh, they got some things done. I, 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 I still think some of the things that happen in those kinds of environments are about time more than they are com- competing. Right. Let me ask you about the 44 Farms Team Invitational coming yeah. up on Friday. Yeah, we have a good competition starting here Friday. We're going to have a deck, we have a decathlon going on as well, a heptathlon. Uh, so, so we, uh, yeah, we start on Friday. Uh, we'll run a couple, couple preliminary rounds of the 200 and the intermediate hurdles and the 5K final. We'll run that on Friday evening. Um, but, the, but the meet is on Saturday. The bulk of the meet is on Saturday. Uh, we have a lot of schools from, from around this area. Uh, but USC is coming in here this weekend too, and USC has some has some fine talent. Fine talent. University of Southern California, not not uh, South Carolina. Uh, so we we've uh, we've got a good good competition, and it's the kind we need. Next week we go down to Florida, and uh, it's it's kind of like the LSU meet. It'll be a big step in the uh, up, and that's what we're trying to trying to accomplish. Coach Henry, thank you, sir. Appreciate yeah. you as always. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I good luck this weekend. It. And uh, thank you to Brazos Running Company. We'll have a break. Trisha Ford will be in studio. They had a great win yesterday, a no-hitter. We'll talk about that in more. It's Ags Radio.
I prefer to look at the most recent thing when we talk about softball here on Texas Radio. A bounce back performance for AM yesterday. Uh, he had the combined no hitter, 10 run, a 10 0 run rule against Prairie View. Trisha Ford in studio with us. Hello, Trisha. Howdy, how are you? How are you? Doing better, doing okay. better. Yep. Well, yeah. we're going to start with yesterday. Okay. And then we can work our way back to, right. to, to LSU. So I know it's probably still frustrating, but the ability to turn the page and, yeah. and get the kind of result you need to see, how, how, how important was that? Uh, it was huge for us, honestly, and I was interested to see what that looked like. I thought Emily Levitt threw a heck of a game. Uh, Vestal came in and um, finished things up, and it was just a very clean game in the circle. I felt defensively we moved some people around. We got some people at bats. So we accomplished what we wanted to out of that game, and I felt like our energy was good. And you had one of the things you mentioned post game was getting Vestal, Vestal another inning, just making sure and yep. continue not having that no-no go away. Yes, yeah. She did a great job of coming out and just pounding the zone. I felt like Brooke's movement yesterday was was back to being what it's capable of being. She had a couple of 2,400 RPMs, which is, it, it's like a, I don't know, it's a, a ball that's, you know, going every which direction. So she looked much better, much cleaner. Um, and like I said, Lovett had her change up working and was able to kind of command both sides of the plate. And how about Emily? Just a strong, strong, strong performance. Yeah, she did. She did great. Um, and, and she just, you know, she got herself in some tight situations and she just continued to go, OK, this next pitch, this next pitch. Um, and, and she made big pitches when she needed to. And so um, Prairie View, they actually swing the bat pretty well. Like if you look at their stats, there's um, a lot of um, kids that are hitting well above 500 or sorry, 300. Um, quite a few kids in the 350 range. And so it was nice for her to come out and uh, just pound the zone. So I, I saw this stat yesterday. I want to read it to you and, and have you respond. The shutout win is the 11th of the season, which is eighth most in the nation. As a coach, yep. that that's you want to see. Yeah, well, if we shut them out, we win, right? right. That's Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, absolutely. I feel like our, um, our work in the circle has paid off this year so far. Um, we've definitely developed and gotten better in there. Lefty has been a beast. Um, and so I just think, again, like how are we going to get better for this weekend? Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Let's go back to LSU because everybody who was here pre-interview, we were talking about like, you get this hit here, you get this hit there. Yeah. Like it's, it's a sweep, but you're probably thinking about the plays that didn't happen that would have given you the series potentially. Absolutely. Um, our first um, night's game obviously went to extra innings, um, but we had so many opportunities. I think we left um, at least seven runners on base every game. And so you're just, you know, a lot of things are going to have to go your way if you're going to leave that many on base. And I felt like we, we scored early in every game. Uh, we had the lead in every game, and we just couldn't kind of um, – keep going and keep that pressure on them. And so we had some things not go our way, um, and, but that's life. Right. And so um, happy and excited to get back at Davis in front of the 12th man with Kentucky coming in. Is that the more frustrating part too, is that you have the lead and you know, like, we just take care of business. We go, we win this series. A hundred percent. Absolutely. So um, we have two solid days of practice, which will be good. Um, we'll get some things in, address a couple of things that I feel like we, we need to address and then get back out there and compete. And then when you're behind, the ability not to get the hits that you need to get in those timely situations. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was really, we had our, our what I would call our dogs up, you know, with a lot of opportunities and we just couldn't, um, you know, make it happen. And so that it's just sometimes how it goes. You're going to have off days in the circle. You're going to have off days in, in the box. But uh, and, and one of the games in particularly, we, we didn't do well defensively. Pitching struggled, and we didn't hit. And so mm -hmm. that's going to be a long day. And you were happy with how Maya played on – the dates are confusing. Thursday, not Thursday, Friday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she did a great job, and she did yeah. a great job last night, actually. She came mm -hmm. through with two big hits. I think she had three or four RBIs last night. So – She's getting there. She's yeah. she's progressing, you know, um, and and getting her opportunities. And, and we talk about this almost every week, but it becomes even more p apparent when you go on the road. The SEC is a freaking grind. Yeah, yeah. But doing it like to win on the road, it like yeah, it doesn't it, matter the sport, and you are y'all are li living it right now. How difficult it is. Yeah. But that's the fun part, and that's what you and I were talking about. I enjoy that. I enjoy the gamemanship. I enjoy the chess match. I enjoy, like, how can we one-up or how can we win this situation or this pitch? And um, it can get mentally draining, and I think how you respond to it is big. And I felt like this weekend, honestly, it got really, really hard. 
and I didn't love the way we responded. And so that's something that we're addressing this weekend or this week and talking about. But um, I just I know what we are capable of doing. And so that's where it's like, hey, let's rise to this. Let's let's, you know, let our preparation be the results uh, that we're looking for. Well, and let's talk about this next series because you get Kentucky, yes, at home, but you were telling me, like, this is a really good squad. Yeah, they have a kid that's a senior in her last year, um, Schoonover, who's, you know, just beat Alabama twice this past weekend, so they took the series against them. And so, um, you know, she's going to be pretty firm up and in, and so um, with a change. And so anytime you have kind of those two different extremes, it makes it, it makes it hard. I mean, pitching is about pitch, you know, deception and messing up with timing. So, um, yeah, so we're going to, it'll be good. And they have a couple other uh, pieces in the, in the circle, um, that make it difficult. They have a lefty and then they have another, uh, righty, but they all kind of complement each other. But that's what the sec is about. Yeah. It's every weekend you're facing an all American, like, how are you going to respond to that? And so again, I'm excited as you should be, um, it's all about results, obviously, but the little things are what are going to tally up the results that you expect, correct? Absolutely. And we've talked about that, you know, having, instead of having, you know, a really easy inning for the opposing pitcher, you got to get five hitters up to bat, or you have to get seven pitches in an at bat. Like you, it's the wear and tear throughout the game and both, you know, ours and baseball sport is how many times can you get that lineup to turn over? How many pitches can you make that pitcher throw? And so, those are the kind of the little things that when you're looking at how you win ball games, those become very key factors. I know that you enjoy the grind of the SEC, but how nice would it be every once in a while to have a game <laughs> that you're not biting your nails? Like it's, it's not decided because it's the SEC, but it, you feel comfortable. It's not a one-run game. Yeah, I'm just not built that way, I yeah. guess, and that's probably why I'm here. Um, I love competing. I love that feeling. I love probably the high of it, of just knowing that you've done all the things mm-hmm. um, to kind of get you to this moment. So. Um, I don't know. I just, I think it's the best, it's the best part of life is right. competing in everything you do. Trisha, thank you so much for coming in. Good Thanks. luck against Kentucky. Get thank it. You. All right. All right. All right. Our talks before the segment are always fun. <laughs> if you, and we're, we're going to one day do a, a show like the off camera show. We'll, we'll do that. Thank you very much to Trisha Ford. We'll come back with an open segment next on Tex Ags radio.
All right, Tech Tags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's go to the hotline. Billy Lucci joining us to talk about Landon Rink committing to Texas A&M. Billy, good morning, buddy. Good morning. Sounds like you're at AT&T. What are you doing? (laughs) I'm just walking out of the storm. There you go. Now you can deal with the birds. What's happening? Hey, man, let's talk Landon Rink. Well, we know what's happening. Well, we know. I mean... Kid's dad goes to Texas, one of the top guys in the state, and he's going to go to a it looks like. Yeah, I rem- actually, <clears throat> we'll talk about his dad in a little bit, Shane, but this is a big, big get for the Aggies. I mean, point blank, this is a guy that uh, this, this staff, Elko, Bateman, uh, Spencer, TJE, the the recruiting staff there is the guy that they targeted from day one for a lot of reasons, and the biggest part of that obviously is what kind of player he is, but it's also how he's wired, David. How hard he plays, how much ball matters to him, and uh, just the type of hard nosed, tough guy player that he is, and that physicality. All of those things that I think you're going to see in him make a really conscious effort. Uh, to keep adding to the roster. And he kind of embodies a lot of uh, where I think you'll see that push go. Um, and he checks all those boxes. But, oh, by the way, when the ball snapped, he is a – you go watch him last year. He is an absolute wrecking ball. Did it against the highest level of competition over there in the Houston area. I think he had at least 15 <clears throat> at least fifteen sacks last year. And he's a guy that they, they can move all over the defensive line. He's probably – going to grow to an inside guy. I mean, he's 6'2", 280. I think he'll be... When you see him in person, you can tell he's going to be... He's really wide, and he's really strong, quick, powerful, you know, an explosive player. But then you combine that with a level 10 motor, and you've got something that you can really work with up front. I think, I think he's a guy that's going to cause a lot of problems uh, for opposing uh, offensive lines. John Harris was on the show earlier, and he said he saw him against North Shore, and he's like, this is the only guy I was watching. I had my eyes on him. He, he shows up on film and in person. Yeah, I didn't hear John say that. That's interesting to hear. That, but obviously you and I put a lot of stock in, in John's assessment and things like that. So that's, that's a, certainly a plus on the ledger right there. But, this again, this is it was a high-value target from day one for these guys when they got here. and. Again, another head-to-head win for a defensive lineman over Oklahoma. It's hard not to laugh, and they're sitting here just every day uh, trying to tamp and get guys out of out of the out of the portal for A and M. You're trying to they've got their list of D linemen that are at A and M right now that they covet. It seems like, and and we just watch the Aggies add another one uh, in Landon Rink because that was a true head-to-head between the Aggies and Sooners, and. Uh, they're actually doing a nice job of recruiting right now. I'm giving them a hard time over losing the head-to-head D lineman, but that was a big head-to-head over a team coming into the SEC. Um, Ohio State was one of his finalists as well. If you go look at Landon's offer list, it's as impressive as anybody's out there. There's very few uh, teams in the country that he couldn't have signed on to play for this early in the game. And, and Billy, you said you wanted to chat about his dad, and you know, obviously uh, yeah. giving him the leash to go to A&M too. Like, there apparently it was his decision to make. Oh, yeah, and that's, and that's the way you always hope it is with players, even even the Aggie legacies, of which, you know, most most of them end up at A&M. Some of them don't. You know, you, you hope that the, that the player gets to make the pick, and that's always been the case there. Um, I was just going to say, you know, A, his dad being a football coach, first of all, you can see it when you watch him play. And B, I just, just a little sidebars I, I remember him because he's probably about my age if not maybe a year older or younger and uh, he was a high school teammate you know with with our boy Sam Adams so they were like the absolute terrors of, of the Houston area for a couple of years there Shane Rank and Sam Adams at Cypress Creek the D lineman at Cy Creek and I just remember and uh, way back in the day when I was a young and remember you 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 hear about 
Rankin Adams, and you know, Sam went to, and I had some a lot of friends that grew up with him and stuff. But in that Cypress Jersey Village area, so was hearing about them all through high school, and you know, one's an Aggie, one's a Longhorn, and uh, both of them with big time college football sons. You know, Sam's son strongly considered A&M, ended up staying up there in the Seattle area at UW, and and now uh, Landon ranked to the Aggies. Our buddy Joe Gleason posting a video where he talks about, Landon Ring talks about uh, Coach Elko and Coach Spencer, huge factors in the choice. So uh, already paying off some dividends, Billy. Big pickup, man. This is, and by the way, a real moment. Billy, I appreciate you, sir. Thanks for jumping in quickly. See you, man. Billy Lucci there on the hotline. Uh, a lot more from him later on in the week. Let's do this. Let's go inside of more of this uh, with uh, Bronny, Broniger, Ryan Broniger. I don't know. I got tongue-tied there. We'll talk to Bronny. We'll break down things from a recruiting perspective, what this means moving forward for other targets, and, of course, some Maggie baseball with Ryan Broniger. That, your text messages at 979-693-1150. Your questions for Bronny that we can get into uh, recruiting-wise at 979-693-1150. All that and more is Tech Radio.
And we are back here on Tex Ags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. We call this Recruiting Country, presented by Caprock Health System, a faster patient center revolution in care with two ERs in the Bryan College Station area, the original 24 hour ER in South College Station on William D. Fitch, and the full service hospital with, with ER in Bryan on Briarcrest. Online, CaprockHealthSystem.com. With that, Ryan Browninger's in the house. You're so, not the only one that can wear some tight fitting sleeves around I'm this. Gonna, I mean, I feel small compared to Ryan O'Brien and, and you. Well, yeah, me. I'm the Ryan that you need to feel small next to. Well, I still would like my chances in yeah, a jiu-jitsu oh, role. Well, I wouldn't like your chances in an overhead bicep pose, though. Oh, I would. Are we talking about, like, uh, aesthetics? Or are we just talking about size? <laughs> size. Oh, okay, you win there. Size matters, David. Well, I have a joke <laughs> that I'm not going to go with there. Uh, how, thank you for filling in the last couple of days, last week, and then you're going to fill in the, the rest of this week starting tomorrow. B team is growing. I Dude, got people I saw walking. a post about you like, hey, if Nuno wants to leave, you know, Bronny would be great. Well, listen, when you start, though, we started in the negatives. We had more people that didn't like me that were like anti B team. So, you know, we got, we got work to do just to get back to net zero, and then we can start about taking off from there. But yeah, we got people. Maybe wanting to make shirts for it and all kind of stuff. So we'll see. Well, buddy, uh, I've been in the negative since July 6th, 2021. So I, I appreciate oh. that you also started in the negative. I thought you hmm? – July 6th or January 6th? July 6th. No, I wasn't there on January 6th. July 6th <laughs> is my first day at Texas, <laughs> 2021. What were you doing in January 6th that year? Uh, I was actually at ABC 13 <laughs> reporting on the news that day. <laughs> And guess what? We didn't have much of a sports hit, believe it or not. <laughs> it was all about <laughs> something else. Okay, we better get off yeah. of that. Anywho, uh, Landon Rink, last week, you felt good. Obviously, we never know how these things are going to go, but you felt pretty good, and today he made it official. Yeah, and actually what a lot of people don't know is Landon Rink was on campus this past weekend and wanted to keep things quiet because you know kind of how that would be perceived, and he was wanted some intrigue with his mm -hmm. decision today. But, um, yeah, so we – we kept that off the message boards and, and off of social media, but just uh, I, I tweeted this. Obviously, Landon Rink's a sensational football player, and when you look at his offer list and you look at the final three schools that he had it narrowed down to, A&M, Oklahoma, and Ohio State, obviously three very good football programs. Uh, and when you watch him play and you watch him in person or on tape, especially in person, like the thing that's most impressive about him – he's got real talent and skill. Like, no question, he plays with outstanding technique and leverage. There's not many high school def interior defensive line prospects that I've watched that have as good of a feel for technique, leverage, like all those things that really matter whenever you're going up against SEC caliber offensive linemen. He already understands that. So he's going to come in way ahead of the game. That probably has to do with – him playing, like his dad being his defensive line coach and defensive coordinator there at Cy Fair. So, like, he's grown up with an understanding of how to play the position. And he's just so far advanced in, in those – you just don't see that. Like, a lot of high school defensive linemen, they just overwhelm people because they're bigger and stronger. And you're going, okay, like, where, where can we see this going down the road? If he's big and – long arms and big hands and he's light on his feet or he's got some good pass rush moves. That's usually what we're talking about with high school defensive linemen. For Rink, you see all that, but you also see it with proper technique and he just gets underneath opposing offensive linemen. So that there is typically a learning curve for defensive linemen when they come in to have to learn how to do that. He's going to come in with that skill set already. But – even saying that, like it kind of undersells how his explosiveness and then just how stinking hard he plays. And I was covering the game. They lost to North Shore. They upset Katie last year in the playoffs. And then their next round, you know, your, your reward for upsetting Katie is that you got to go to NRG and play North Shore. Right. And, you know, North Shore ended up pulling away from that game. And if you're watching with us, you're, some of these clips are from those Katie and North Shore games. So he's doing it against the best talent in the city of Houston, but watching him against North Shore and just leveraging guys and recreating the line of scrimmage in the offensive backfield, but just how hard he was playing. Like he walked off the field, he was exhausted. And he does that every time you go watch him play, whether it's against the elite competition or a team that they're, they're beating up and it's late. And I went and saw him against Jersey Village, and they're up by 40 in the third quarter, and he's still running around like with his hair on fire. He just – he loves playing football, and this is a massive get for Mike Elko on the field, but it's also, I think, a really massive get 
for the locker room and the culture of the program that he's trying to build going forward. And we talked so much about that, how the ideal player is, I, th I think for Mike Elko, as he's trying to transition and, and get his locker room the way he wants it and the culture the way he wants it, the ideal player is super talented, like no doubt can play in the SEC based on his skill set, but also a guy that is going to do things the way we want them done. Sure. And I think Landon Rank checks those boxes, both of them, immensely. And so when you're looking at future leaders of the team, team captain, like Landon Rink would fit in that mold. What do you think was the tipping point? Like why did he pick Texas A&M in your opinion? I think just even – let's go back to whenever he started getting recruited by Texas A&M under the old staff. It was something I think he just felt super comfortable coming to College Station. Uh, it wasn't the deciding factor, and I actually asked him about that in our interview. He, he called me – he called me actually after he committed – not this past weekend, but the weekend before. Uh, and so I did a commit interview. It's been in the kind of the can. In, the, in, the, in the can for nine, ten days now. But when I talked to him about that, he said that I asked him about proximity. He was like, you know, it wasn't like the deciding factor at the forefront, but and it was like a bonus. Like ain't him at all this stuff that I was looking for. Plus, it's less than an hour from my my house. Mm -hmm. So, but I also think that he just he kept coming back. And he's just so comfortable here. He would come with some of his high school buddies, and he got to know uh, so many guys on the team here. And then when you think about it, he grew up half his life in Dallas when his dad was coaching up there. So he played on the same peewee team as Tiger Rodden, and he knows Kelvion Riggins really well. And then, obviously, when he moves to Houston and becomes an elite player out of Houston, now he knows Dejon Petaway and Josh Moses really well. So, like, there was some good crossover there and some comfortability with the guys in the class. And – I, that goes so that goes back to the old staff and then when Mike Elko and them came in one of the first stops he made was at Cypher he drove to Cypher by himself coach Elko did and he went in and sat down with coach Miller there and then saw Landon face to face as one of his first stops when he got the job and I think that let Landon and his family know okay like this guy's for real like we're a priority for him and since then coach Elko coach Tony Girardetti coach Chaos, like they've all made sure that Landon understood just how much he was valued and coveted in this recruiting class for them. And it, that took some effort because when you're coming in kind of behind the eight ball, Oklahoma made a huge push. Ohio State made a massive push. Right. And had kind of not gotten on, on level pegging with A&M, but was close, was eating up the ground, eating up the distance. And A&M with Coach Elko – like they kind of reestablished their lead uh, as they got into College Station and began forming those relationships with Landon and, and, and his dad and the whole group. So it, it's really, and by the way, it's a perfect example of parents letting their kids choose what's best for their kid, right? Shane Rink played at Texas, and he was a good player at Texas, yeah. really good player at Texas. Not once, and even I can, the first time I ever talked to Landon Rink, I asked him, I said, well, your dad went to Texas. How big of an influence will that have on your recruitment? He said, 0%. He goes, I may end up at Texas, but it won't be because my dad went there. I'm open to every school. I'm going to try to find the best fit for myself. And his dad said the same thing. You know, that's, you know, that's his football career, not mine. I'm trying to put myself in those shoes. and like, I, It'd be tough to do, right? It's tough, but what's the most important thing? Where does your kid feel comfortable and the happy. relationships? Yeah. Happy, right, exactly. Yeah, and I don't know that you – know, I don't know that – Texas didn't make some missteps in their recruitment of sure. him. That where they went, well, that's not on par from what all the other schools have done. Like, why, why do they, do they mm -hmm. not like us? As, you know, whatever it was, there could have been that, some of that involved where they just, Texas had some massive whiffs in terms of their approach and their recruitment. But, yeah, it, I really admire a parent that can do that for their kid. And I, I know it would be tough. Yeah. You yeah. know, think of Christian and Cruz said, hey, we want to go play soccer at Texas or wherever. Like, you'd be like, well, well, I've told them their whole life that's impossible. I've, I've said that like yeah. to all, of, especially my girls that can play at Texas. Yeah. You're not going. That being said, when it becomes that time, you got to let them be an adult and pick the best situation for them. Sure. It's not my life. It's their life. Sure. Absolutely. It's their career and their, their successes are theirs and their failures are theirs. Uh, and it's hard not to own. I don't have kids for myself, but just doing the baseball stuff for as long as I have with 12, I can, I know that it's hard for parents to sit there and go, Okay, he struck out. I want to go talk to him. Well, yeah. he, he struck out. 
You sit in the stands and let him figure out how to strike out. Yeah. It's no different than whenever he hits a double or a home run. You didn't hit that double or home run. He did it. When Christian Cruz scored a goal, you didn't yeah. score that goal. You know how hard it is for me not to talk about everything, though? It's very hard. Right. It's very, very hard. But you just sit there Sometimes and let, you them, gotta let, it be. let them figure it out. The yeah. best thing my parents ever did in my sports career was whenever I had some trying times, whether it be in junior college or when I got to McNeese, and I wasn't playing as much as I probably thought I should, mm -hmm. they never once said a word to anybody. That's your job. You have a problem, you go say something. Right. Or you work harder and you figure it out. That's that's not on them. So it was that was a really good lesson for me to learn, like through the athlete lens. And so sure. and I can't imagine doing it <laughs> when your kids is a nearly a five star recruit and going through the whole recruiting process. How about the Sean Spencer angle on this too? Because there was some fear when Elijah left. Like, can you continue recruiting at this level? This relationship yeah, that he had. Yeah, you're still in my thunder. That's actually the recruiting article I'm going to write for next week. So I'm good at this. Uh, yeah, that's part of what I'm going to look into. Is look, there's no question when Elijah Robinson and God rest his soul Terry Price were here, how formidable of a duo that was along the defensive line. And you're going to sit mm -hmm. there and tell me as a guy like Tony Girardetti that he didn't learn from either of those two guys. And I don't know if Sean Spencer has any background with Elijah or TP, but he, he came in with some real feathers in his hat as a recruiter and a well-established reputation as a recruiter. Um, so when you put him into the mix and then Tony having played here and his connections in DFW and then what he probably learned from being around Elijah and TP for so long, like – there was there's some unknowns with Tony, but right now he's doing a fantastic job because he obviously was a, a big help with Landon Rank. I wouldn't say he was the lead guy. I would say that was Sean Spencer and Mike Elko. But I th Tony has been an integral player for these Dallas prospects and A&M's connections and kind of reemergence in DFW. So that's actually the article I'm going to write is, is looking at these two and comparing them like could A&M after, after having – Elijah and TP and them being such a key and integral piece of A&M recruiting for so long, could A&M replicate that under Tony Girardetti and Sean Spencer? So I know you made the trip around uh, Southeast Texas. You started off at Jasper yesterday, right? That uh, was two days ago. Two days I was ago. at Jasper. Um, it was weird. Southeast Texas, you know, I went down for Eastern, got to see the family and then, you know, stuck around for a couple of days to hit some schools and then Come to find out, like, most of the area was out of school on Monday and then half of them were out of school on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I was like, are we going to class down here? Like, what, what's happening? <laughs> what's going on here? But, uh, yeah, so I went up to Jasper on Monday, uh, got to talk to two A&M offers, Demetrius Dean, the offensive lineman, who does not have anything set up for Texas A&M. What, what did you just make that face for? Adam Schefter. Um, Stephon Diggs traded to the Houston Texans. Whoa. Whole and – I saw reports all week that, hey, the Texans are about to make a big splash because of all these moves that they're making to yeah. allocate some space. There you go. Well, hmm. That's big. C.J. Stroud, Stephon it's, Diggs. Sorry. Yeah, I, I cut you off. Not just Stephon Diggs. I mean, you look at that whole receiver core now. Pretty good. Yeah. All right. Sorry. You, all right, we're doing uh, recruiting country. Where was – oh, yeah. So I was talked to Demetrius Dean. He does not have – he was at junior day in February but does not have anything set up right now for a &M, but was wanting to get up for a practice or even the spring game. He's amongst that group of offensive linemen that you're like, okay, he's got an offer. Um, there's a bunch of them that have offers, but do they get big pushes? Right. Um, and then, obviously, kind of the, the bell cow there at Jasper is Keati Armstrong, the nearly six foot seven, 265-pound tight end who's just – I mean, you don't see guys that big move the way he does. And – me and Jason did an in-home visit where we talked about, like, no doubt, first off the bus kind of guy. Yep. Like, just when you start looking at what his frame is now and what he could be. And remember Darnell Washington that was the tight end at yep. Georgia? Just Matt, like, that's what he could remind you of. But, I mean, he could even get bigger than that. So, what I think with Kiati is you recruit him as a tight end and you kind of see what the body does when he gets where here. Goes, yeah. He could play defensive end who, if he gets too big. I don't think he'll – he just – he's – I think he's too good of an athlete right now to just say, okay, he's going to be a tackle. I think that would do him a little bit of a disservice yeah. because he could do so many other things. Um, but, he, you know, 84-inch wingspan, dude. It's crazy. He's a crazy athlete. You just kind of get him in there and figure out what he is. But A&M's doing a good job there. He was supposed to be in this past weekend, wasn't able to make it, but is for sure coming this weekend okay. now. So uh, that's good to hear if you're an A&M fan. But, you know, there's a lot of schools in that one. Texas, LSU, Miami. USC, like he's he's hearing from everybody, and um, 
But I, I do think that A&M's in a pretty good spot for Kiati. Like, he, the kid has always really enjoyed A&M and coming up here. So we'll see there. And then uh, yesterday I stopped P&G. at P&G, P&G yep. and uh, talked to Jackson Christian, who will be here tomorrow and then on Saturday. So he's got two visits scheduled this week to A&M, um, and he looks awesome. And he – First of all, he's off the charts intelligent. I watched him with like 80-inch wingspan, 81-inch wingspan, yeah. something like that. I watched him bench press 330 pounds. You know, for a high school kid with that long of arms, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, he's got massive hands. He's got – like all of his measurables when he came in at A&M were like – I think that's what made the coaching staff go, holy crap, like this kid's like – he's measuring like the NFL offensive linemen do. Uh, and it seems like that one's coming down to A&M in Texas. I'm going to talk to Jackson whenever he leaves on Saturday. Okay. I didn't want to do an interview with any of these guys that were coming up this weekend. I was like, well, I'm going to have to talk to yeah. you after the visit anyway. Why, why do that? Um, but, you know, and PNG's also got a, another offensive lineman there named Aaron Wolford, who's a class behind him that is really, really light on his feet for a six foot five, probably 270 pound kid. So uh, I, I would expect Coach Jeff Joseph and, and PNG to make another run at a perhaps a back-to-back state championship. Of course, the UIL didn't do him any favors. They stuck him in a – listen to this, district. So, P&G and Montgomery Lake Creek are in the same district now. That's two of the top five teams in the state. Why they're are they also, in the same district? And they've also – you think about how far of a drive that is. It's like yeah. two and a half, two-hour drive on a Friday night to go play. But then they've also stuck all those in Region 2. So, in Region 2, 5A Division 2, you've got Port Natchez Groves, Montgomery Lake Creek, South Oak Cliff, Melissa, and Lucas Lovejoy. That might be the top five teams in the state. And they're all? And they're all in the same region. Goodness gracious. Anyway. But, and then from there, from PNG, I went over to Port Arthur Memorial. I uh, got to talk to Tank King and Michael Riles. Uh, Michael Riles has um, a defensive lineman, has an A&M offer. He's, gonna, he's coming up the 16th, so the week before the spring game. He's going to come visit. Um, that was a kid that I think he got pretty close to wanting to pull the trigger and then kind of slowed things down. Uh, and if he would have pulled the trigger earlier this spring, I think a would have gotten him. But, you know, again, defensive line like offensive line. I think the kids and the a and coaching staff on both sides, like a reciprocating, feeling everything out. Sure. You know, yeah. so uh, – and then Tank King, 2026 linebacker, who is just a maniac Tank. on the field. He just tackles everything. The biggest thing – the biggest proponent or the biggest, uh, the biggest compliment or, I guess, feather in the hat of Tank King – that I can give right now is as a freshman in high school when he could have been an eighth grader age wise. So he's a 2026, but he could be a 2027. He's very young for that, for that grade, that graduating class. So as a 14 year old, he led a five, a division one team who was number top five in the state all year, led them in tackles as a 14 year old, as a 14 year old kid. That's crazy. And he's, I, when I saw him the other day, I was like, dude, you're getting taller. So, so he's still developing. Yeah, yeah. he's still getting bigger and because he's so young for that grade. Uh, but A&M, LSU kind of at the forefront for him right now. He, he loves A&M. He was up here last weekend. He really likes Coach Bateman. He really likes Good. Coach Elko. And, you know, it's a long way off for that class. But there are some certain kids like him and Isaiah Williams from Fort Bend Marshall who's going to come up this weekend. The very top of that class, like these guys are going to be lay down top ten players yep. in the state. You don't want to get too far behind on those guys. Yeah. Even though their decision dates may be over 12 months away, it, it's better to be you know, too early than too late with those kind of players. All right, let's hit a break here. If you've got a question for Brian, you can send them in 979-693-1150. You can text that question to us. You can do it on the YouTube chat, on the Texax chat. We'll get to uh, some baseball as well on the next side. It's Texax Radio.
All right, we're back here on Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. It is the Rollo Insurance Studio, and it is time for Recruiting Country. Well, it still is time for Recruiting Country. Brought to you by Caprock Health System. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Eric Casares has got a question for young Ryan Broninger. Kevin and Austin said, want to ask Bronny about the kid from Hitchcock, my alma mater. Yeah, Kelshawn Johnson, I think a he's part of that. Again, there's just so many position groups where we're going, okay, let's see who's going to mm-hmm. get uh, the big pushes from the coaching staff. But Kelshawn, I think, would, would certainly be one of those. When you watch his tape, it's hard not to imagine him in an Anaya Smith type of role. And I think he's even – well, I don't think. I know he's faster straight line than Anias uh, is and was at this stage of his development. But you, when you watch the tape, it's like he just – find space where there isn't any space uh, and is really good in and out of breaks and creates the separation because of his quickness. And I, I, I like Kelshawn. I really do like Kelshawn. It's going to be A&M, Texas, Penn State's actually still involved in that one. Um, but, yeah, I think A&M's doing a really good job with Galveston County product. Any uh, intel on Adam Cushing and how he's doing on the recruiting trail? Yeah, I think he's doing really well, and especially when you look at a and standing with some of those top guys – uh, in DFW, mm-hmm. and you're you're talking about Ty Haywood and Marcus Garcia at Denton Ryan, and Michael Fasusi at Louisville, and um, Lamont Rogers, and there's just a, you know Connor Cardi, Emeka Gorgi, all those DFW offensive linemen, and then you know obviously A&M still isn't you know I mentioned Jackson Christian at PNG, uh, Jonte Newman at Bridgeland, so they're they're combing through the state far and wide, and even out of state with guys coming in, and what I've been told about coach Cushing is he's a great teacher of the game like he is a teacher and he's very cerebral and um, I think the biggest thing that a coach can be right now I actually said it whenever I was hosting radio with OB is like as a coach you better be a polyglot and a polyglot somebody that speaks multiple different languages because as a coach even though you're using English to get your point across you better be able to say things in multiple different ways absolutely the you know the synapses in everybody's brain fire different and they latch onto different verbiage and turns a phrase differently. So whatever, you, however you've got to explain to a kid how you want him to slide on a protection, you better be able to explain it a hundred different ways because all it takes is one of them. If it clicks with his brain and then you've got it right. But I've heard that Adam Cushing is, is that kind of guy. He does a really good job of explaining exactly what he wants and getting his point across. And they don't, they don't move on from, one thing until they master what they're trying to get done. So I think it's a very, like almost a 180 degree difference than what we've seen. Let's talk a little baseball for the last few minutes of uh, recruiting country. Yesterday, obviously a, a great win. Um, and I say great win because they did what they had to do. They took care no, of business. That's a, no, that's a really good win. Heck yeah, it is. Yeah. Like people don't understand that Texas state, they play with a big-time chip on their shoulder and a big-time edge. And I think Schloss even said that in your interview with him on Monday. Mm-hmm. And, and when you started looking at just kind of A&M coming off a really emotional weekend against Auburn where you had to walk off on Saturday, you're going to Texas State. You know, it's a bus trip in the middle of the week again, in a packed house at San Marcos where I'm sure there were people that were wearing burnt orange at Dish Falk three or four weeks ago that were now wearing Texas State stuff. You know, yeah. last night, and it's there's some people in that part of the state that really don't like losing A and M, and so you knew that it was going to be really rowdy, uh, and it was, and they had standing room only seats, and you know A and M just comes out and, and Braid Montgomery, like what, what more can you say? And like when you start talking about great seasons in A and M history, we're only halfway done, so he's got to continue to to do it. But we're, I'm not talking about just in baseball, David. When you look at what he's done. Remember, Last year in 64 games at Stanford, you know how many home runs he hit? 16. 17. 17, sorry. You know how many he's got in 29 games? 17. That's insanity. It's ridiculous. And the one he hit last night, backside homer into a howling wind. Howling wind. And he hits it out to get A&M going, and then they never really look back the rest of the night. I thought there were some big pitching performances, most notably from Zane Badmiev. Yep. That's a guy who's kind of been in and out. He's been pitching in midweeks mostly. But I said last night on the board, there's going to be somebody on this pitching staff that hasn't been called upon yet to get big outs and big moments. And just inevitably how baseball and baseball seasons go, that guy is going to emerge in a spot this year where AM's really going to need him. Could it be Zane Badmiev, who is you know, a doctorate student here and has seen and done it all as an old experienced guy? Could that be him? I'm not saying it is, but could it's, be. it could be. And that's an encouraging outing from him last night to come into that game. And I also thought Brock Peary late – 
strike out the side. Uh, I think he came in in a tight spot in the eighth and then struck out the or the sixth and then struck out the side in the seventh. And again, it's another one of these deals where like A and M plays a shortened game where they don't get to hit their entire nine available frames like they do you know, when they're winning at home. Going, they don't hit in the bottom of the ninth, and they've had all those run rule shortened games. Like when you look at what the offense has done, start taking off the innings where they hadn't even gotten to hit. Yep. And Gavin Grahovic was fan freaking tastic again last night. And I said in the game thread, here's my prediction for this weekend in South Carolina: Jay Slavolet homers multiple times. Okay. I just if something. Th- yeah, and it's like he's been going. Not quite. He had the he had an opposite field homer against Auburn, but we've seen when Jace gets it right and gets he going. He gets it right. Yeah, and like it wouldn't surprise me. It, like Jace can like that run that home run total right up there with Braden in a weekend, you know. But you know, Ryan Targotch is starting to find some confidence. What does that mean? If if Ryan Targotch returns the form in the batter's box, what does that mean for this offense? Could we see? And look, this is probably asking for too much, but multiple guys with thirty homers? No. Okay. No, no, no. I think that's asking too much. Okay. That's asking too much. Again, like But it, Braden is Bright well, you just you enjoy every day. Yeah. You know, and we'll see where where it all lines out at the end of the year. Twenty two, twenty eight home runs possible between those guys. But but yeah, I think they could both get to twenty five. Yeah. No question. But look, man, this team is we sit through the first couple of weeks, like we still don't know. They're fun and it's been fun and it's encouraging. They're still really fun. But I'm getting to the point now where the encouraging part is you have bits and pieces of what happens on the field that are encouraging. But I'm at the point now where, like, this team is really, really good. And it's going to take something completely out of the ordinator that we haven't seen so far this year for them not to start, you know, knocking down these national seed type of uh, doors and getting postseason play at Olsen Field. Well, and and not only that, this series at South Carolina, which is going to be very difficult. These yeah. are one of those series that you talked about. Like, you got to win some of these road series. This is one that you... You don't have to win. Like, it would be an enormous deal to go to South Carolina. That's, a, that's number one, a really good team. team. The country, yeah. Yep, they're really good. They've got Ethan Petrie in the outfield, who's one of the, the premier hitters in the country. They play with a ton of emotion at home. And, but because you swept at home last weekend, you don't have to go to South Carolina and win the weekend. Like, right. But here's what my deal. Like, what happens if you go out and you win on Friday night? And you've done your job. You've held serve on the road. You're not going to get swept on the road. You go out and win Friday night, and you win that one, and you're going, okay, like, with what we've got available in our bullpen, what we've got available in the starting rotation, as dynamic as our offense can be, we, can we go on the road and, and win a series? So that would be back-to-back weekends where you've swept at home, and you win a series on the road, now when you're starting to look at that final SEC record, if the goal is 15-15, and 15, and that's a reasonable goal for everybody in this league, is 15-15 and 15 because you know that'll probably get you a host, with the, especially the way A&M's done in the out-of-conference, yep. then you start going, okay, how do we get to 16-14? and 14? Well, we're going to need to sweep somebody at home. You did that. How do you get to 17-13? and 13? We're probably going to need to win one on the road. Can you do that? You know what I'm saying? And right. look, there, there's probably going to be a hiccup there, somewhere in there where you're going to lose a home series. You just hope you don't that's ever just, get swept that's anywhere. SEC baseball. Yeah, it's just part of the part and parcel for playing in this league. But it, it's, you know, it, we talked, I wrote last week, like Jackson Appel has been incredible. It, it's, he's a different profile player from Gavin, Jace, and Braden. But Jackson Appel has played his way into professional baseball this season. He will continue to play at a professional level. How good's Teddy Burton been? He's been phenomenal. Right. He's like fourth in batting and, on the team. And don't look now, but here comes Hayden Schott. Mm-hmm. Starting to get a bunch of hits, which is exactly what we saw him do through the entire fall. And we start to see him like through the early spring. Like Sometimes he doesn't hit the ball hard, but this guy just gets a bunch of hits. Now he's starting to get a bunch of hits, and I think maybe he's figured out that Hey, I don't have to be the 15 home run, 15 double guy that I was at Columbia for this offense. I just need to just get some hits and see get what happens. Hits. And then you start passing. How good's Ali Camarillo been? Heck yeah. Offensively and defensively. If Ryan Targotch is playing with some confidence like we've seen over the last week, yep. and he's down there in the 7 8 hole, like, dude, like the upside for this offense is the best in the country. 
Now, there, there's some swing and miss in there, whatever. That's fine. But we know, like, you can start seeing, like, you can piece it together, and it's not unrealistic to say if all these guys are starting to round into form and play kind of to what we thought they would, you're looking at one of the best offenses in the SEC, and in turn, that means one of the best offenses in the country. Thank you, Bronny. Thank you. Appreciate you. That's Recruiting Country brought to you by Caprock Health System. When we come back on Tex Sachs Radio, Kendall Rogers, D1 Baseball, some more baseball to get into. That and more is Tex Sachs. Tex-Ax Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Uh, it's time to talk a little baseball with Kendall Rogers. If you want to sponsor the segment, D1 Baseball brings it every week. You can hit us up here uh, on Tex-Ax, get this sponsor. What's up, Kendall? How you doing, buddy? I'm doing awesome, man. How about yourself? I'm good, man. So um, let's talk a little. You, you got to see quite a bit of A&M recently, but let's just talk about what we'll, we'll start off with last night and work our way back. Uh, your thoughts on what you saw from, uh, I guess, Brady Montgomery over the last the entire half season, but especially this last week. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to run out of good things to say about him. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what, you know, in college baseball, you see guys locked in and then you see guys locked in like that. I think he's one of those guys, man, that like you can just see it in his body language. You can see it in his approach to the plate. Um, you can see it in just the way, just the, the violent nature of the way he's hitting the baseball. Man, he is just 100% locked in. And, you know, what's really cool about him is, you know, I asked him about this a couple weeks ago, or, uh, you know, about when he, you know, when he gets in the box, like, does he, 
does he kind of sense the buzz that, that's in the crowd? And, you know, it's kind of funny. I felt like for a split second he's going to try to say no. Then he kind of smiles and said, no, yeah, actually, I do notice it. It's really cool. But then I kind of realized, like, hey, you know, like I've got a job to do here. So, you know, I think he's one of those guys, man, like he's really smart. He's got a great approach. And, like, he, he just truly is one of those players that, that lives in the moment. But, I, but other than Charlie Condon in Georgia, uh, and maybe James said the Florida State man, there is not a guy that is hitting the ball with such authority as, as he is right now. And that's been big because, I mean, Jace, you know, he'll, he'll be fine, but, like, he hasn't been quite as productive as he was early in the year. So, Braden being what he is right now has really helped A&M, to say the least. Talking to Kendall Rogers here uh, from D1 Baseball and Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. So, the victory at Texas State, Look, I, I know midweek games, it kind of depends on the philosophy. I know Schloss wants to win them all. Um, but that's a big win, especially the, by the, the score amount, the the deficit that De- Texas State had to play against, right? They were down big time most of that game, all game long, I should say, especially from the first inning on. Uh, but just talking about the significance of those midweek games that do matter, um, how a and taking care of business. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was an impressive win because I mean Texas State is a dangerous team who obviously they didn't play very well against Louisiana last weekend. So I think they wanted to probably go into last night to make a statement and kind of show, hey, we're, we're, we're not dead yet. And, you know, A&M just didn't give them any, any you know, air uh, to come out of the water with. So um, I just think when you look at the state as a whole, I think there are teams that season progresses that will get a lot better. They're just going through some tough times right now. And you know, Chase Mora, who had an awesome year last year, the Tomball native, um, he, he hasn't had a great year so far. I think he's going to eventually heat up. But, yeah, I think the biggest thing when I look at A&M is you look across the SEC and you look at LSU losing to Southern, you look at Mississippi State losing to Central Arkansas, uh, Florida, uh, Florida's midweek struggles are well, well chronicled here. Uh, and you look at what A&M is doing in the midweek, and not only are they playing or winning games in midweek for the most part, they're playing extremely well. And I think that says a lot about the team and a lot about the depth of this team to you know, have you know, a, a pitching staff where you can go out on the road uh, in an offensive-friendly environment like that against an offensive team and continue to excel. So, I, I, you know, I, I said, you know, talked about how Montgomery was locked in. I think this whole team is locked in. And, you know, you, if you're an a fan, you're hoping that they're locked in all year long. It, it's not easy to lock in for four months, but, uh, boy, this, this team is going to test that theory a little bit. Talking to Kendall Rogers here on Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Is there – T- t- tell me a little bit about Ethan Perry in South Carolina and the concerns about, again, going on the road in the SEC, how difficult it is anyway. Take on a, a South Carolina team that's got a really good resume so far. Yeah, they're a weird team. I mean, they've got a couple of blunders. I mean, they lost a series to Ole Miss on the road. Who's, uh, Ole Miss has not been very good, uh, especially as of late. Um, they've got a series loss to Clemson, albeit, uh, you know, they were two, uh, two walk-off losses. So, no, you know, no, no harm, no foul there. Uh, but, you know, then they go home and sweep Bandy. And, you know, I will say Bandy was awful in that series, to say the least. But, you know, South Carolina, you know, with Eli, Eli Jones, you know, Tyler Pitzer uh, on the mound on the weekend, uh, you know, even Petri, you know, you know, offensively, he's having another great year after the, the, the dominant freshman campaign he had last year. Uh, and, of course, Cole Messina. I, I know the offensive numbers aren't great, but he's an elite catcher. And he's a guy that can actually really hurt you um, if he gets going offensively. So, I think I actually think Aiden matches up pretty well in the series. I think South Carolina is one of those clubs that is solid, but I think they really feast on teams who just aren't bringing their A game. And I think, I mean, until proven otherwise, I think I'd be a little surprised if Aiden did not have a A game this weekend in, in Columbia. Yeah, and look, these Brian and I were talking about it earlier. There's going to be some series that you're going to find a bump in the road at some point, but outside of Florida, and no that question. Was, and that that was a series that A and M could have won. They should have won, in my opinion. Like, they are, I don't want to say exceeding my expectations, but they're starting to make my expectations seem more real. Yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing I like about this A&M team is the, just the number of options they have on the mound right now. Uh, do, do I think A&M's bullpen is what I would classify as elite? Probably not. But, I mean, You've got, you know, Evan Ashenbeck, who, you know, right now is probably the most consistent, best reliever in college baseball. Uh, you know, Brad Rudis, you know, he dropped his arm slot. He's been really effective. Josh Stewart is a little bit rudis light, but actually has a little bit more velocity behind his fastball. But, again, the slider's a really nasty pitch. Uh, you can come out of the bullpen with power and Chris Cortez. 
the thing I like about this ain't a bullpen is like, it, you know, every guy that goes out there may not be elite like Evan, but every guy's a much different look. And that's kind of what you want out of your bullpen. You don't want, you know, you don't want to throw a guy out there that's 96, 97. And oh, by the way, your next dude is 96, 97. It's all different looks. And I think when you have that, I think it makes your bullpen really effective, especially when you look at, for the most part, how solid the starting rotation has been. Kendall, can you put your finger on what the issues with LSU are this year? Well, I mean, it's, you know, somebody joked around about the national championship curse, but I mean, at this point, I'm starting to believe it might be real. I mean, Coastal Carolina a few years ago after it won the national championship struggled the next year. Uh, you know, Ole Miss and Mississippi State struggled. LSU struggled. And I saw that Dave Johnson came out in the media in Baton Rouge today saying that no more phones allowed in the locker room. So, uh, you know, I, I love Jay, but like, when you're when you're coming out with a no more phones in the locker room uh, speech in the media in April, uh, things ain't good in the clubhouse. So I'll be very curious to see like just what LSU does. I mean, LSU is LSU, so I, I like they're the last program in the world I'm going to doubt here. But I mean, there's no doubt that you know they they've been a little bit weaker than usual behind the plate. Like Hayden Trevinsky over the weekend against Arkansas was not very good. Uh, you know, they're pitching has been, I mean, it's just like a seesaw. Like, you never know what to expect on a given day. And I and I would actually classify their offense in the same way. Like, one, one day, the offense is pretty productive. The next day, you know, they're punching out left and right to Southern and things like that. So, uh, I would say proceed with caution with LSU, but there, there certainly seems to be some uh, signs of trouble in Baton Rouge. How about Houston? Their first sweep against Rice since uh, 2014. I didn't realize that had been that long. Yeah, I mean, you talk about two programs that are scuffling right now, man. I mean, Rice, uh, it, I, I tweeted about this the other day, but it's kind of mind-blowing how bad that program is right now. I mean, that that was the gold standard in the state of Texas along with, along with UT, you know, back, you know, in the early 2000s. Uh, and, I mean, they still – I don't think they actually hit the double-digit win mark yet. Um, they, they've been horrible. And, you know, Houston's not far behind them. I mean, I think Houston's actually a decent team. But, um, you know, they've really struggled in the Big 12 so far. And I thought this was a club that would take a pretty sizable step forward. But, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how those two Houston schools do uh, the rest of the year. What has happened to Wake Forest from being number one to almost out of the top 25? Well, it's, it's twofold, right? I think, one, I think expectations have caught up with them a little bit. Um, I think the other thing for me uh, is two players, uh, Josh Hartle and Nick Kurtz. Nick Kurtz has been hurt, the All-American first baseman. Uh, he's back now, so that should help them. But uh, Josh Hartle, who you know was a first-team All-American coming the year, along with Chase Burns, uh, has just been horrible. Uh, you know, I don't I don't know if the spin rates are down or what, but you know, if you go look at his numbers, I mean, it's ERA north of five. He's not punching out guys left and right like he was last year. Uh, opponent batting average is really high, and until he gets right, I don't think they're going to be completely right. But again. I think they're one of those teams that I think he will find that, that button at some point, and when he does, uh, I think they're going to be just fine. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about that. And what about Oregon State? I think they lost their two games this, uh, the last week, over the last week, I should say. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a weird series, right? I mean, USC is playing an hour and a half away from their campus right now. You know, they're not even playing their home game on campus. So just a weird series, but I mean, Travis Pizana, man, like he, uh, you know, he had what, he's now at what, or over the weekend was at four straight games with a leadoff home run, uh, setting or tying a, a, a baseball record, Brady Anderson, in the big leagues. Uh, he's continued to have a big year. I mean, he's hitting, uh, he hit a 452 uh, foot home run the other night on a midweek game. So they're really offensive. The, the question I have with OSU moving forward, and, and as we look at it in the postseason, uh, is just do they have enough pitching? And I think that to me is a question mark at this point. And last one for you, DBU last night, the walk-off, uh, that program, man. They just, I, I like talking about them because I, I know they haven't come out of nowhere, but they sustain really good programs there. Yeah, you know, Dan Heathner is a magician. I mean, you know, they, they've actually beaten some good programs out for some recruits. Uh, he's got a great culture there. And, you know, I saw them against St. Houston a couple of weeks ago, and that's a really physical club. I mean, you look at, you know, Grand Jay behind the plate, uh, you look at, you know, Ryan Johnson, their Friday night starter, real physical guy, James Olinger, another real physical freshman who's up to 100 with his fastball. They just got a lot of physicality. Uh, and when you have that, you're not only going to win a lot of games in Conference USA, but you're going to win a lot of games overall. I think they're a team for me that will definitely uh, be in that hosting mix in the, the year and maybe, uh, maybe even that top eight mix. 
Kendall, great stuff, brother. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. You got it, dude. Have a good week. See ya. You, you too, man. Bye. Kendall Rogers there, D1 Rogers Baseball there. with his uh, baseball analysis. We'll hit a break here. We'll come back with some stats on the baseball team. Ethan Jones been working on those. Right now, though, Millican Reserve, Farm to Table Community, they're in College Station. They got homes. They got farms. They got wide open, wide open spaces. And their mission is to build a healthy community around nature, and they've done that. If you go down on Wellburn or 6 and you stop by there at uh, Millican Reserve, you're going to be blown away. Uh, they are creating a sanctuary for family, for nature, and for community out there with their 2,600 acres of open space, a beautiful place that you'll find all the farms you want, 30 miles of trails, and they got great homes out there as well. And those trails, they're throughout a wooded landscape that includes walking paths. You've got equestrian paths out there. You've got creeks. You've got ponds. You've got gathering areas. It's really a great place for families to connect with each other and cherish generation after generation. When you go, don't be surprised when you see the white-tailed deer out there, the songbirds, the rabbits, the turtles, and all homeowners there at Millican Reserve sharing a legacy of conservation, which means generation after generation, you're coming back to that same place, pristine countryside place out there at Millican Reserve. Their website is millicanreserve.com. Again, that website, millicanreserve.com. Check out their neighborhoods, the creek, the hollow, the meadows. You'll love them all, millicanreserve.com. It's Texax Radio. Time to end the day with Double Dave's. Caller number 12, 979 693 1150. We're going to hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls and a large one topping pizza from Double Dave's, serving Aggie Lance since 1984. 
They've got your favorite pizza. They've got your uh, favorite pepperoni rolls. They've got reliable in-house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click on DoubleDays.com, and your favorites are on their way. Ethan Jones is in the house. Yes, sir. Deeper dive into some of these stats. And one of the guys, we've talked about the numbers when it comes to Brady Montgomery, but Mm -hmm. you looked at a different angle of, of the way he's producing. Yeah, obviously we know how good he's been, as good as advertised. But one of the best parts this season for him is he's maintained his level in play in most areas of his game in SEC play and even improved it in some areas. And here's a few stats that show that. Um, first, batting average in non-conference, a 394 batting average. A little less than the SEC, 368, but still really, really good. Yep. Hits per game, 1.4 in non-conference, 1.6 in the SEC. RBIs per game, 1.9 in non-conference, 1.6 in the SEC. Total home runs in non-conference, which is about 20 games. I can't remember the exact amount. Nine total home runs in the SEC, eight total home runs. So he's averaging... 0.9 home runs per game in the SEC and only 0.5 in non-conference. And then strikeouts, 0.7 and 0.7. So overall, he's looked just as good in SEC play in non-conference play, and that's big time. Big time player, and we talked about him maybe being the biggest recruit we've seen here at a Yeah. Also, there's a few more stats that just show how good he's been overall. His batting average, the 385, ranks 7th the SEC. He has a slugging percentage of 954, which is 2nd the SEC and 4th in the nation. On base percentage of 518, fourth in the SEC. He leads the nation and runs batted in with 51 and is second in the SEC and nation with 17 home runs. He's second in the SEC in total bases with 104. Um, and then when taking into consideration SEC games only, Braden Montgomery leads the conference in total bases with 46 and home runs with eight. So overall, he's been one of the best players in the nation, period, which is awesome. Um, another guy I wanted to highlight, uh, Gavin Grohovac. The freshman. Bro, what? So good. For a freshman, this is crazy. Um, And, like, here's some of his stats. He has a 345 batting average, 36 RBIs, and a 198 OPS. Um, But one of the most impressive things is when you compare him to other freshmen, he's one of the best freshmen in the nation. Um, So total hits is 41. National ranking among freshmen, the sixth best freshman. Runs batted in, 36. The third best freshman. Home runs nine, third best freshman. Runs thirty, yeah, runs thirty nine, um, the best freshman, and then slugging percentage uh, six fifty five, which is the ninth best freshman. So overall, he's been one of the best freshmen in the nation, and just one of the best players in the SEC in general. Um, he ranks third in the SEC in conference play and hits with, uh, or yeah, third in the SEC in conference play and hits with fifteen and home runs with five, and has thirteen RBIs in SEC play which and is I, fifth most in the conference. Uh, and we got about a minute left here. Jace, uh, Br- Bronny thinks he's about to explode. What are some numbers that will tell you that? I think so, too. He's been in a little bit of a slump, but still has been really good, um, especially when it comes to powerful hitting. Um, and slugging percentage, he has a 755 slugging percentage, which is 12th in the SEC. Home runs, he has 13, which is fifth. Triples, two, which is second in the SEC. And total bases, 80, which is eighth. Um, another thing he's been good at is taking walks. Uh, 29 base on balls, which is third in the SEC and 18th in the nation. And then one of the biggest things that I think tells me he's going to be back to his level of play is that before conference play, he had a batting average of 329. He was top in the SEC in many different categories. He's just been a little bit of a slump. In the SEC, he's had a batting average of 222. But if he starts to play better, this offensive trio that I just highlighted will be unstoppable. Well, and they already feel unstoppable. Yeah. Ethan, thank you for your time, buddy. Yes, sir. All right, that's going to do it for Tech Sags Radio here on a Wednesday. Tomorrow, Ryan Bronger can be your host tomorrow and on Friday. I'll see you guys back here on Monday. Thanks so much for watching and listening. We'll see you manana.